sad news about Terry Venables passing at the age of 80. And of course, Mark Saggers will have all the information on that. Big thank you to my team again, Isla Lones, uh, Carla Battisti, Minty Gao, Dave Rhodes is graced us with his presence again today and finley knowles i will be back next saturday and sunday of course so in the meantime uh, do take care uh but stay tuned stay with us here on talk tv for the one the only mark saggers see you next week this is talk tv Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. (laughs) That is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are Definitely you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They're that right. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and radio. 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Two big football games today in the Premier League and Spurs were ahead against Aston Villa, but they lost it by two goals to one. Everton, with all the problems that they have had and with uh, what looks like uh, the 10-point deduction can cause them all sorts of problems now, were well beaten by Manchester United by three goals to nil. At Goodison Park, we'll hear much more about both of those games. And, of course, before the Spurs game at the stadium today, everybody remembered Terry Venables, the great England coach, the man 
along with Alan Sugar, had the highs and lows at Tottenham, but there was so much more to Terry's life, and Terry left us today at the age of 80. He'd been ill for some time, but he was the greatest coach I feel that England ever had, one of the greatest coaches in football. He was relaxed, he was happy, and very different to the other great coach that I've been privileged to know and be scared of at times, Sir Alex Ferguson. They were different. One had great tactical awareness but kept the players in their place. The other just allowed them to do what they wanted. Throughout the next 90 minutes, plus extra time, plus a few penalties, we will talk with all sorts of different people who knew the great Terry Venables. And let's start with the man who was the chief executive at the Football Association in the days, first of all, of Lancaster Gate, when we all used to have to stand outside. David Davis, of course, a top broadcaster before that, and uh, somebody that uh, had to handle uh, the whole of uh, Terry's career with England. David, very good evening to you. Evening, Mark. Um, we want to laugh, don't we, with Terry right now? Yeah. Very much so. I mean, that's my abiding memory. I was out shopping in a car park today here in the West Midlands, and when I heard this news, and the contrast on a miserable day in the West Midlands, in most of the country, I think, mm -hmm. with what I remember Terry Venables for, couldn't have been starker. Terry Venables, to me, the memory of Terry Venables is laughter. <laughs> we laughed and laughed and laughed so often that, you know, I sometimes when we shouldn't have done, probably, I fear, and we uh, uh, we provoked a little bit of wrath from one or two of those within the FA occasionally. But, uh, heck, you know, there were so many things that I could tell you about him <laughs> that lifted our fortunes and lifted my spirits when I was down, and I was. Mm. Yeah, he, he seemed to know how to deal with people, and, and people from every walk of life. Of course, you know, there he was, uh, a man from Dagenham in Essex, uh, a man who uh, was uh, um, part of a family that, uh, well, his, he'd got his dad, Eric, uh, to look up to, and then, of course, he had his, his other uh, aunts and uncles and godparents and everybody helping to look after him. But Terry was always destined to be a manager after he was a footballer. And I think one of the, one of the things that I always found uh, so refreshing was that he was ahead of the game the whole time, whether it was business that wasn't going to work or whether it was football that was. He was ahead of his time. You know, I was lucky enough to... I worked uh, in the early years in uh, the northwest of England. And I can put my hand on my heart and say I knew Busby and Shankly and Fagan and Bob Paisley and those sort of... those wonderful managers. But Terry was the greatest manager, if I may say this, of his generation. Mm. He was ahead of his time, for example, in the way he managed abroad. Yes, I, I used to go watch him as a kid on the terraces at Stamford Bridge, then at Tottenham. I know, and then he continued playing a little bit at QPR. And then he, then he went into coaching and he was ahead of his time as a coach at Crystal Palace and, and at Rangers. And he got the chance against many people in Spain who said, who is this young bloke from East London? coming to Spain to be the manager of Barca, Barcelona, for goodness sake. And they won La Liga, and they went to the final of what is now the Champions League. Mm. And then, of course, he came to England. And something I would add about him, Terry, like his father Fred, the late Fred Venables, was a great patriot. And so, therefore, when he became manager of the England team, it was the realisation of a real ambition. He had a sort of team around him though didn't he throughout his whole lifetime and they were everybody from Eric Ashby to Ted Buxton of course who was one of his assistants with you at the Football Association and a man that eventually became manager of China and of course really Terry knew him from the early days that he was this 
the family butcher who used to cut the rump steak well. You know, I mean, you, you just couldn't make this sort of thing up these days, could you? Mr. Ted, Mr. Ted, <laughs> when we were going to China, went ahead of us and told the Chinese uh, communist regime he wasn't happy with the pitch <laughs> that we were going to play on. And he was quite brave. And then we arrived in, in Beijing mm. and, you know, in go the players. And then the chant starts, Mr. Ted, Mr. Ted, Mr. Ted. <laughs> and yes, Terry basically, you know, sometimes when people talked about his business associations, yeah. you know, Terry would, would always say to you, his life wasn't uh, a doddle. And there were periods of unpopularity that I mentioned. Mm. And he said, when you said to him, well, you know, there are people within the FA who are a bit iffy about some of your associates, he would always say to you, they were loyal to me and I am loyal to them. Mm. And loyalty ma mattered a great deal to Terry. Mm. And, but he was a force of nature. And when he knew you were on his side, you were always oh, on his side. It's fantastic. I remember I was a young whippersnapper in those days. For... Oh, not that much of a whippersnapper. No, I wasn't that much, but I was quite, when it came to television and Sky News and we'd just launched Sportsline, really, and Terry became the manager. And I remember, didn't know him didn't know him at all and I remember because you did the great uh, grand opening at Wembley and he'd got the manager's black coat on and he strides out and I thought I told our cameras to roll and as he came up to everybody else I went out in front and shook his hand and he sort of gave me a strange smile and everything but then it was at one of his first I think it was his first press conference because of course there was the problems at this stage um, with uh, Alan Sugar and everything that was going on at Tottenham and uh, and what have you. But I, I had, in those days, David, and you'll know way more than me, but there was a football focus, there was uh, the regional um, commercial television uh, network, and there was these new pretenders on the block, Sky News Sport, which was me, and I asked him a couple of questions about the business <laughs> dealings and everything, and he hauled me. And he said, uh, I don't know you. I don't know what you're talking about all of this for. You've got to prove it to me. We need to see each other. And and yeah. cut a long story short, we went out for lunch uh, once a month, really, very nearly right up to the, the, the Euros. And uh, I got to know him. But he was also a brilliant listener because that first, <laughs> that first <laughs> meeting, he said, right, um, you need to tell me why you can ask me questions about football. He's, and he said, so we're going out for lunch. Uh, you pay and yes. I'll choose. And we went to the Ritz for our first lunch. That's where he took us. And uh, the Queen Mother was actually two tables away. And I'm thinking, I can't believe this. Anyway, we sat there. And as we did every time we, we did all this, he, he, as I said, he was a great listener. He just wanted to know what I'd done within football to be able to ask questions. And we listened, he listened to me and everything. At the end of it, he said, right, he said, we're going to do this on a regular basis, Mark. He said, and uh, we year and a half out from uh, Euro 96. And he said, uh, I want you on a napkin at every restaurant that we uh, go to to write the team I'm starting yeah. with in Euro 96. And he said, um, I'll give you one clue out of all the players available to me, if they're all fit, there is one name right now that I would have on my starting sheet. He would be the first. And uh, I hadn't got a clue who it would be. I mean, I talked to everybody from Shearer to Gazza to David Seaman to what have you. And uh, he said, no, no, none of them, Gary Neville. Gary Neville is the best fullback I've ever seen. He's the best and hardest right back I've ever seen. More importantly yeah. than that, he's got such a knowledge of the game, he'll keep the back four where I want them so I don't have to worry quite so much about Gaza picking the ball up and going off on his runs. Yeah. And, you know, that in, th there was just the first lesson of a, of a, of a great coach. There was the great thing that, that he, he would actually tell players these things as well about themselves mm. he he was he wasn't aloof of course and that was not his style at all but he would take play individual players aside and he would talk to them mm. yes he would kick a few of them mentally i mean by that mm. he would also hug a few of them tough and tender 
That was an expression used in politics that was also used in football, and he believed in it passionately. Mm. But, he, I mean, I go back to my basic point, which you've which you know as well as anybody, that he would laugh, you would laugh with him. Uh, um, we played a few pranks on the media. I seem to remember one about the, the, the journalists who would come to two pre one of two pre press conferences, mm -hmm. those who did, uh, did longhand, those, those who, who could write, uh, who did capital letters, those who wore, were, could write in other ways. And he always, he always liked those sort of jokes on April Fool's Day, that sort of thing. Yeah. And we, I also, we also sent a message. I remember that he and I were moving both our departments from number 16 Lancaster Gate mm -hmm. to a Greek restaurant up the road and that people should always contact us with this Greek restaurant. Um, that And that didn't go down terribly well in certain quarters, I seem to remember, but it was typical Venables. He yeah. and And he... Also, I mean, you, you, we haven't mentioned his musical ability. Oh, Terry could have been not just a football person. He could have been a singer of some quality. He sang. I seem to think he sp sang in Spanish and he used to enjoy showing off his Spanish, particularly during Euro 96. And there are people who can bear testament to that. Um, and but he how many football people can mm. say that they sang with the Joe Loss Orchestra? Yep. I don't many, no. and he certainly did. And then, of course, he sang regularly at his club. There he is. You see him. And he was very, very good. Twenty Number 23 in the hit parade was his highest. Goodness me. Well, I didn't, a, it was, I, I, I didn't know that. It was an Elvis Presley number. The other, the other, <laughs> the other thing that I will say, because we then started to have um, our Sky News Sport parties in Scribes. Uh, Scribes, obviously, yeah. it, underneath what uh, in in High Street Kensington. Then, of course, you could only get in if they let you in because the door was straight out onto the pavement, and yeah. the Daily Mail always annoyed him that they were only just above. And then he realised <laughs> that they were all big drinkers, so he was quite happy and made them all members of the club at the the same time. But I remember on one occasion we'd had a a big Christmas party, and I'd got there early in the morning, and this was classic Terry. I'd said to Terry, oh, "Do you mind just coming along, Terry?" Got a lot of other good sportsmen and women who'll be there but got our team as well who'd just like to say hello and he said well I, I can't stay all day but I promise you I'll be there and I got there early and we'd ordered a couple of crates of champagne and the barman uh, who was there uh, said who you're I, getting I, paid I more than I thought you were no 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 this is a, no, this is all Mr Murdoch was saying no, it's a good oh. ending to this so okay. and then he um so I said uh, yep yeah, everything ready for lunch and what have you and uh, the barman said, everything's all right except the champagne. Is there any way you can pay us now in cash? He said, There's the, they won't deliver it unless we give them cash for the champagne. So we did that, and we had some great stars there. Roger Utley was there. Yes. Uh, we've got Kenny Sansom there. We've got uh, Mark Eilock, who was a great cricketer at that stage. We've got the Pittmans there and all these others. We've got Kenny Sansom and, and what have you. And everyone having a great time. And then one uh, who will remain nameless, and it wasn't me, one of our sports reporters, a little worse for wear, had had a swing at one of the Daily Mail journalists who mentioned them in a column. You can probably imagine who it might have been. And uh, anyway, he then collapsed on the floor and we he, he was carried out on to Kensington High Street by Terry, by Roger Utley, by Mark Highlight, by Kenny Sansom and by Mark Pittman. Could you imagine if the Red Tops had got hold of that? They're then with this yeah. guy trying to find a cab and then they and throwing him in. But it was it was just like that all the time. It was great that, fun. That, well, not all the time. Not all the time. You know what I mean, yeah. but not all the time. I know what I know what you mean. He he and I um, it was quite by chance that I got to know him. Well, I was still at the BBC in the days when uh, one BBC Match of the Day reporter would go with mm. one cup final team, another one would go with the other. And Jimmy Hill, the late Jimmy Hill, used to toss the coin in the Match of the Day, day office. And it was Forrest, not Forrest, Nottingham Forrest against Spurs. Mm. And Tony Gubber was the other BBC reporter. And everyone assumed, because my home was in the Midlands, that I would want to go with Nottingham Forest. 
I was very clear that I wanted to go with Tottenham and I won the toss. So I went with Tottenham and that actually changed my life mm. because he, I went to see him the week before they were playing at Tottenham, at uh, Liverpool. Tottenham were playing at, at Liverpool, mm. last game of the season. Yeah. And I had coffee with Terry on the morning of the match and we got on very well and life mm. went on then we were in the team hotel not a quiet secluded manchester united type of hotel uh, a rather busy central london hotel i seem to remember at the time and life developed completely from there and i told that i remembered the story as well today terry was two years and it was shameful that he he didn't stay at the mm. fa as england manager mm. and you know he was one of those few managers who 98.9 .9 of players respected light in certain cases I, I don't think i exaggerate to say loved yeah. and I, I i survived however it happened for 12 years in the fa and he came to my leaving do all those years later and he said <laughs> i want to speak and i said okay must you and he, he said i must so he said I, I sometimes put on the the Venables accent, but it's too early in the evening to do that, I think. Yeah. And uh, he said, well, of course, people always wondered why David and I got on so well. He said, one reason is we both came from London. I, came, I, Terry, came from the East End of London. David came from the posh part of London, the Euston Road. Now, my mum would have had a fit if she'd... Uh, realized that Euston Road was be, being described as a posh part of London. That's another matter. He then said, we had one other thing in common. And I thought, I know what's coming no. now. It, what had emerged was we both had elocution classes at school. I, because I couldn't pronounce certain letters and words, and this wonderful woman effectively created a voice for me. And Terry said, we both had elocution classes at school. I leave it to you to decide who had the better teacher. I was about that, and he brought <laughs> the place down. And uh, but he was he liked to laugh, including at himself. Some some people don't know that he was actually quite sensitive as well, mm. and he would rather like a number of football managers. You'd think, oh, they have to be very tough and thick skinned and all that sort of stuff. He wasn't, I would not say he no. was thick skinned. Mm. He was resilient, which is a very different thing. And, you know, I can remember occasions when he was quite hurt by some of the criticisms that he got, mm -hmm. some of which may have been fair, some of it which for sure were not fair. Yeah. But he kept this laughter in his life. And people said he had a had a grasshopper mind, and I've been accused of that, that he couldn't concentrate for long periods of time on one subject. Well, actually, I thought that was complete nonsense, because if he was concentrating on a subject, he would get to the bottom of that subject. Why mm. was this player not playing well? And other things like that. But always there would be that smile, that slightly... Uh, and if you if you questioned him, he, you, he'd put on that slightly naughty boy look look sometimes <laughs> um and uh sometimes that, he maybe he had been a naughty boy but i we it, it just endeared him more and more to it me it absolutely did i mean that's showbiz one other thing though after a lot of these lunches he said to me there's nothing like a free lunch mark uh, <laughs> and that, actually that was at the uh that was uh, at the one just off uh, the Strand we were at, where the the, the, Max, the the Maxwell sons were just celebrating having won their court case. And we're on the next table. And I said, uh, what do you mean? He said, what do you want in return? I said, well, if you ever lose the England job, can I please um, have the interview um, for Sky? And he said, sure, you've got it. And if you remember on, when Noel White and the um, international uh, team of the FA were together and, and Terry was trying to negotiate, this was before Euro 96, a new contract and he wasn't going to get it. And we used to all have to stand outside in those days. And Ted Buxton came out and said, um, there's going to be a big press conference down the road. And I presume it would have been you and Graham Kelly, who was then the secretary of the FA at the Royal Atlantic. Terry won't be there. He's left off out at the back. Um, he's not probably going to go on after Euro 96. He'll see you in scribes if you can get away from everybody else. So um, we jumped into the car and on my way there, I'm just thinking, 
if Terry doesn't let me in here now and changes his mind, I know I've lost my job because Sky were going to do their first, Sky News were doing their first big uh, live news sports um, yeah. programme from the Royal Atlantic and I was supposed to be doing it. But there he was when I got to Scribes and he, I went down, down, the, down the steps and he was in the old uh, fake uh, Georgian armchair, leather armchair <laughs> with a, a glass of champagne and a cigar. Did a brilliant interview and it was videotape in those days. Rushed to Millbank, hot rolled it for the six o'clock news, which meant we just started, put it on. And uh, it was the first time that Rupert Murdoch's Sky News um, had to be... Um, well, told about on the BBC and the ITV because they'd got the exclusive and the strap lines yeah. came up on both. And that was thanks to Terry Venables. Lovely to talk to you as well, David. Some good days. My pleasure. OK, that's great. David no, Davis. What a perfect way to start this. Harry Harris, who knows uh, Terry as well as anybody, will be with us next. Um, Theo Delaney, who's uh, been a Spurs fan all his life. And uh, Howard Hodgson. Uh, will also be uh, joining us as well uh, from Aston Villa as we look at their match and how Spurs pay tribute to Terry today. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to use the XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are Definitely you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion? Can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. Dave that Ryan. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Well, we're talking about Terry Venables and his life and times after the news that Terry Venables died yesterday at the age of 80 after a long illness. But for many of us with uh, in broadcasting of sport and within the great game of football have got so many memories of him and most of them very good. Perhaps not 
quite so many people in business have quite such good memories of him, but he made everybody uh, in the end laugh, except perhaps for one or two. Uh, one man who certainly knew him as well as anybody uh, was Harry Harris, uh, the great broadcaster, journalist, and of course, author of more than one of uh, Terry's uh, books, and certainly Venable's The Inside Story. Uh, was one that I remember, and uh, the other, the life and times of El Tell, the controversial career. Harry, good evening to you. Well, how are you doing? Well, I, you know, I was very sad when I heard the news because I, I knew Terry really well, but I, I wanted to make this a real celebration and, and, and have a bit of a laugh. You agree with that, don't you? Uh, I do. Yeah, I look, um, uh, people have got the wrong impression uh, of, of my view about Terry Venables, Mark. Um, my, my view is, is, is the same as everybody else's. You know, I, I knew him um, as a genius, as a coach, uh, a great innovator of his time, uh, and, and one of the greatest managers um, of, of that kind of innovation that he brought to the game. Um, there's no question about that. You know, um, uh, uh, in fact, there's a, a there's a story in one of my books. In fact, the book you refer to. Um, Graham Kelly came to see me and two, two or three other leading journalists, chief football writers at the time, and asked their opinion. Should we appoint Terry Venables? Should he appoint Terry Venables as England manager? Uh, and I gave him an unequivocal answer. Yes, he should. My, my view to Graham Kelly was that he needed to sort out all the peripheral issues surrounding Terry Venables. I don't think he did, but he still appointed him anyway. Mm. Oh, absolutely, and I, I think that was uh, important. I think the only, the only thing for me, two, the two perhaps uh, amongst uh, uh, quite a few of the managers at that time, my very close friend Chris Turner, who was manager of Cambridge United and Peterborough United and everything, and Terry Venables, they were very similar in a way. They were big personalities. They'd got all sorts of talents. Both of them thought as well that they were great businessmen, and neither of them really were. No, it's a shame, really. He, he just should have stuck to his day job, really, Mark. You know, and then we would be talking about a complete character who was uh, a genius, yeah. but really he was a flawed genius because the, the entrepreneurial aspects. So he, you know, he came from a, a humble background, mm -hmm. a humble background as much as we did, Mark. And, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, he performed, he managed, he played. And he thought, look, you know, as a result of my talents, owners of football clubs are, are making fortunes. Mm -hmm. And his view was, you know, perhaps I could be an owner as well. And, and he, he, he believed he could uh, and tried his luck. So all the tributes you're going to get, they're, they're marvellous, but... I'm sure, I'm sure there's one trip you won't get, and that's from Alan Sugar. Yeah, uh, uh, probably and uh, exactly that. But uh, having said, I mean, that whole story, when you remember it, of course, um, with Tottenham Hotspur, Terry always said to me, and I, I don't think it was a joke, that uh, Scribes West had the... Uh, um, th they'd managed to get hold of the, uh, the dance floor from White Hart Lane. <laughs> no. You're going to set me off, aren't you? You know, one of our famous. <laughs> uh, it's not really fair. You know, we should be um, celebrating his life. Um, well, we are celebrating. I am celebrating that because I mean, we never we would we'd be there, and he'd get on the mic, and he'd do everything brilliantly. And I mean, if you think of the everybody who sort of went to Scribes West and everything in those days, I mean, they were all there from. Eric Hall, Monster Monster, to Vinnie Jones, to everybody. Yeah, look, I mean, it, it was fun. It was a laugh. Um, but, you know, when I was sort of found that his, uh, his uh, dance floor at Spurs had been nicked and taken down to Scribes West, he wasn't amused. You know, I, I, you can understand that, can't you? And, yeah. and when he's found all the, all the dodgy invoices and all the bogus payments to agents and all this sort of stuff, it wasn't funny to him, but you know, <laughs> when you look back, um, you know, and in my book, I, um, mm. I, I liken him to Minder. You know, he's a yeah. likable writer. Um, but well, he was part he, of he was part Harry, wasn't he, of, of writing Hazel, the great uh, 
the, the TV, he was very much part of that in the TV programme, wasn't he? Yeah, but watching it and then becoming it is a bit different, really. And, and I think um, the, the fact is that, you know, we, we should be celebrating his... his um, uh, attributes as a, as a phenomenal coach, and everyone and play. Who came across him, you know, he, everyone he touched uh, has a story about how they improve, how he improved them. Um, what what you'll find in my book, of course, is a more rounded uh, um, mm. uh, version of his life and his times. And I think people will be surprised now because you know um, you and I lived through it many many years ago. And, multitude of headlines and documents mm. that we produced and all sorts of things and you know um, he, uh, I, did, I did documentaries about it and, yeah. and numerous books about it because he was just such a fascinating character yeah. and, and, and probably unique when, when, when you look into what he did in his business life what mm. he did in his business life and the kind of people he, he dealt with it's probably one of the most fascinating characters that ever lived in. And I think one of the the other thing for all of the footballers that that he helped and uh, and showed things was his communication with them because he knew, and you mentioned it there. You know his his humble beginnings and the family pub and everything, and 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 then uh, he be, he had this instinct, didn't he? That he he knew how to let the players think they were getting the better of him at times when he was coaching them, and you know he'd, he'd let them do one or two things, but he he also knew exactly how they would fit into his side. Well, he did. I mean, I'm writing a, a, a new book about Spurs with Paul Trevelyan. In fact, it's going to be a history of Spurs in art form. Yeah, and I, I've just. Funny enough, only this week, or last week, penned about 5,000 word article about Terry Venables. And 99% of it is positive. You know, it, it, it is a phenomenal character, a crooner who entertained people with his singing, uh, describes West was a great place to be. He entertained the media royally because, you know, he, he was very shrewd. He wanted the media on his side. I'm sure he didn't love us. But, you know, he entertained us and he, and he, he was great company and he fed us little tidbits. Um, and, and, and for the majority of his career, you know, I was part of that little entourage, you know, I like him and, and, and still like him. I, I still overall think he was a fantastic character and so good for English football. I mean, the, you know, his relationship with Gaza was a, a, a really important one. And do you remember the, do you remember the trip to Rome for the match on the Sunday and the press conference on the Monday with uh, Gaza having joined Lazio and fit to play. And I remember we went to watch the game in the Olympic Stadium on the Sunday and I think it was uh, Boktic who, uh, who scored for uh, Lazio with a brilliant... Gaza was brilliant. And then it was something, something like an Ealing comedy the next day because there were all of these journalists from England. There was a couple of us as uh, TV guys and other reporters and then there was all the Italian press and I don't know if you remember we sort of followed these two like the Pied Pipers of Hamlin and we all got into this room and then suddenly we couldn't move any of us do you remember that we're all in this room together no chance of holding a press conference or anything in there we were all shoulder to shoulder not well, well, too but you know you, you, you've got to thank Gaza for all those years in Rome because I mean I think I spent more time in Rome than London. <laughs> yeah, no, I have. But, you know, Terry Terry knew, I mean, he he also knew, of course, the other thing that is worth telling uh, n now was, of course, the dentist chair in the Euro before the Euros when they all went out, there few of them, um, the, the, it, for the younger people here who perhaps don't know, the dentist chair was a big mixture of cocktails in a bar in the Far East where they were on a pre uh the pre-Euros uh, tournament, and um, they, they, there was a few pictures of them having all these cocktails poured down their throat. And then after Gaza scored one of the greatest goals in international football against Scotland, to then have the, the, the sudden thought to actually mimic the dentist chair in that game against Scotland at Wembley, that was just all brilliant. That was all so relaxed, and that was all part of this Terry Venables uh, tribe that they were. Well, that was all my fault because of the mirror, you know, we were hugely critical and, and Piers Morgan supported me on this. You know, how, how could an England team prepare for a major tournament at home at Wembley by going to the Far East and getting everyone drunk? 
I mean, it, it, it's, um, it, it defies logic. Yeah. But then, of course, it wasn't just the dentist's chair that they were all, all running around with their shirts torn, you know, all, all the liquor pouring out of their mouths and absolutely drunk. But, of course, you know, on the way back, the antics were even worse, weren't well, they? Well, he, he was in the... He was in the... Over, overhead locker. He was in the overhead locker, wasn't he, Gazza? He was in the overhead locker. They denied all of that. Um, Cathay Pacific lodged an official complaint. They were so rowdy. Um, and Terry, you know, you know, good, good luck to him. You know, he said that we, we were all staying together and they denied everything. And, of course, we carried, carried on publishing the truth, but they denied it all. <laughs> and we said, you know, um, Alan Shearer hasn't scored in 18 million games. Why should he be playing? They've gone out to the Far East. They're all drunk. They're coming back, you know, falling out out and playing drunk. How's this team ever going to win? To be fair, they didn't actually start very well. No, but... but you know, once they um, actually um, started to, to hit form, uh, dear old Piers Morgan, you know, so, suddenly we were actually supporting me, saying, this is, you're right, this is outrageous, we were going to condemn it. Suddenly he said, no, we're doing well. It's all your fault, you know, and um, he actually condemned me to the tower. I mean, physically, he had a, he had a seven-foot beef in there with an axe, and he was going to chop off all our heads. Do you remember that? Quite right. Yeah, look, I remember, I remember all of this and, and so much more. Just a final point uh, for Terry. I think it's a shame in the end that um, other dealings got in the way of the International Committee, whatever anybody thinks, because as a coach, and if you look at you look at the modern game and all of the hidden things that go on now even, and money laundering and all sorts of other things that there are, uh, involved at various different bits and pieces in all sorts of parts of the game worldwide, is that um, you know you know Terry Terry really I, I, and I know from a lot of those players they wished he'd stayed. Well, he should have done, and, and, and one of the reasons he didn't uh, is he has so many scheduled dates in the high court. Yeah. Um, but he wasn't the only one that fell foul of uh, off the field antics. Uh, or, or off the field things that today I think just wouldn't wouldn't have counted. Um, no. You know, we've got to look at Glenn Hoddle. I mean, he should still be he should be England manager now. Mm. I mean, he, he he was as good as Terry Venables, mm. possibly in different ways, even better. You know, his team, uh, in, in my view, was even better. Um, and, you know, he fell foul of um, the kind of things that you've had David Davis on. You know, you should ask him why. Um, the, these guys had to fall on their swords, but they wouldn't do now. You know, I think a, a, we'd be a lot more tolerable now. And in fact, we're in an age which is less tolerable, but mm. we'd be more tolerable with those England coaches yeah. who have to give up their jobs. Well, there we are. Harry, thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us here on the Sunday Night Club. Harry Harris with uh, his memories uh, of some great times of Terry Venables. Uh, we're 40 minutes in. Um, we're going to hear from somebody whose father was a great friend of Terry Venables next. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime, but there's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. <laughs> Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. 
If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared to call is Hamas possible a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Well, a very good evening to you if you're just joining us uh, tonight. Um, we're celebrating the life of Terry Venables with uh, some of the stories that uh, all of us uh, who got to know Terry uh, reasonably well um, and the moments that we have with them, many of them great moments. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a larger-than-life character, but he was also a, a brilliant football coach and one of the best uh, over my 40-odd years in this career talking to players about the likes of the coaches, he was right up there with the very best. And it is a shame that uh, the International Committee of the FA decided that after 96, because of all of the other trials and tribulations that there would have been possibly to come with the likes of Alan Sugar and with uh, Tottenham and, and other things in, in court, was going to mean that they didn't want him anymore as their coach, which I think was a great shame because Euro 96 could have been the beginning of something very special indeed. Well, let's speak now to um, Theo Delaney, Spurs show, life goals, season ticket holder. And Spurs were playing Aston Villa today and Howard Hodgson, former director of the Aston Villa uh, Football Club Supporters Trust. Um, both we were just going to talk about that game, gentlemen, but I would really uh, like to talk, first of all, about Terry Venables. Uh, good evening to both of you. Great to have you uh -huh. guys, uh, with us. Uh, Theo, first of all, there was a... I think you did it. You, you did Terry proud. Yeah, well, Terry's very much loved uh, Tottenham Hotspur for a variety of reasons. You know, he, he won the Cup as a player mm. and as a manager for Spurs. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, of great fondness for him at Tottenham. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't surprise me. We, we, you know, there was a lot of emotional out outpouring of emotion today. Um, sad day, yeah. Yeah, what's a yeah a sad day, but this is a happy evening because I want to celebrate his life. I got to know him uh, for some time, uh, it, it, very well indeed. And uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, there are so many people who have so many different parts of life. But uh, he he was actually, as David Davis said, quite a sensitive man as well. And somebody um, who uh, knew him, Howard, of course, very well was was your dad, wasn't it? That's true, Mark. Yes, uh, they were good pals. Um, they frequented the same drinking holes in London, <laughs> uh, particularly Mockham's Wine Bar, um, yeah, which they which they had a lot of fun in together. But so uh, they became really good friends. And my dad had a, a, a good career in business, a very successful career in business, to be fair, and um, and it still is. And uh, and uh, Terry and he became great friends. I just wanted to like literally read a quick quick quote from them both when they were together in the bar um and so this was from my dad today and he said uh El Tell once told me you really are one of the few supporters i have met who understands the game and you know much more about football than i do funerals howard however you must remember i was the england managers so you really ought to listen a bit more carefully when i <laughs> talk about football. 
<laughs> I was put in my place and deservedly so. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. yeah, no, he was uh, he was a thinker and he was always ready as well, Theo, to um, listen to your side of the story too. Yeah, he's a great guy. I met him a few times. I actually made a TV commercial with him and directed him in a yeah. TV. Yeah, and that was actually the strange thing about that was, as I say, I met him a few times. That was the most time I spent with him. And the other times I met him, because my, my brother actually had his wedding reception in his club. You know, he had that club, Scribes in Kensington. And I, I was the well. best man. So we went, I bet you do, yeah. So we went to <laughs> we went to Scribes and did the recce beforehand, you know, and uh, met Terry then. That was really nice. But the day that I shot that TV commercial with him was the very day that he did the press conference where he had to say, I'm stepping down prior to Euro 96, if you remember, that, that he didn't get the backing he wanted from the FA, which you just mentioned, Mark. And um, so he's quite grumpy that day, which was, which is unlike well, him, because, as you say, he's usually a very genial character. He, but he, as you say, he's sensitive as well. And yeah. I think he felt like he'd been he, bad, he, hard, hard he, done by. He, he did think he was hard done by. But, you, but earlier on, I was telling the story that actually the first... Although there was the press conference at the Atlantic Tower Hotel where Graham Kelly and... Uh, David Davis mm. sat down with an empty chair. He'd already mm. skipped back to Scribes because we'd had lunch once a month for 18 months before Euro 96, and just the two of us. And um, yeah. he'd said there was nothing like a free lunch. And at uh, about 5.30, he did an exclusive interview with me for Sky News that we mm. got on the air for 6 o'clock from Millbank, which was the first time that BBC and ITV both had to credit Sky News with the exclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, he then obviously went on later that night, I believe, because he was he was a, a good football pundit, wasn't he? And he went to a game. Oh, he was a fantastic pundit because, of course, he had incredible. The thing about Terry Venables was he was he's one of those people you meet. He was extraordinarily intelligent. He wasn't. I mean, you know, most people in that world, media and the higher echelons of any world football, but he was a really sharp minded guy. So it was, he had things worth, he had things to say that were worth listening to. And that made him a superb pundit. And all the players, as you know, you will have heard already tonight, I'm sure mm -hmm. that played under him. They, they almost invariably say he was the best manager they played for. I mean, we have, you know, I, I, only this week we had David Howes on the Spurs show a couple of weeks ago, the, the live Spurs shows with live audiences. Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks before that, we have Gary, Ma Gary Mabbott on. They both said, no, no question, no, Venables was the guy. And I think he was just, um, yeah, extremely clever. That's what made him a great pundit. Had packed full of knowledge, tactical knowledge. and and uh, But at the same time, very charismatic and charming. It was an amazing, it was a perfect package. And all that stuff about him being supposedly dodgy and everything, I often used to think... If he hadn't been working class, if he hadn't had a Cockney accent, I don't think they'd either got so much stick for all that stuff. But there's always the people, especially in institutions like the Football Association, are quick to judge people like oh. that who do well and who are intelligent, you know, and do well in business. They always say, oh, he must be a bit dodgy. Yeah. And I actually felt like, uh, yeah, he had the... And I, I think, you know, he, he did feel like he was hard done by, and that was probably part of the reason. Yeah, no, he certainly did. But uh, how does your dad found out, and I found out as well, um, that he was uh, j just great company. Oh, utterly charming individual. I mean, I, I was lucky enough to spend a, a little bit of time with him, with in, with the company of both of them, and uh, just just fantastic company. Yeah, um, and um, yeah, it's a sad. It is sad. I mean, you're mm. quite right, Mark. We need to celebrate his life. You know, 80 years old. It's a good innings, but it's very sad. I was watching the. Um, do you remember the famous Yellow Pages ad with, with Graham Taylor, yeah. Bobby Robson, and Terry Venables when he just got the job, and Graham organised the the cake? And you know, it's really sad, isn't it, that all three are gone? Yeah, yeah, you know, three Graham, fantastic Graham, men. Yeah, I mean, we were going to be doing a, a part of the show tonight, which we will do at a later date. A book that's been written about Graham Taylor and and Elton John and what went on at Watford. These were. These were different men, but these were also, I mean, Graham Taylor and, you know, growing up as he did in Lincolnshire and Terry in East London, these weren't anything to do with the Blazard FA. And I think that, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm pleased, uh, although Graham, some would say that Graham would, would nod at the FA because he obviously took over from uh, Terry as well, but he didn't. And um, I, I feel that it was good 
that we had these players. And that they had the ability because they knew the players and knew what to say to the best players and how to get the most out of them. So true. I mean, you only have to look at, you know, what Alan Shearer and Gary Lineker have said today and you know, just a couple, but I mean, all the Tottenham players, uh, I mean, it's flooding in, isn't it? Top, top, top players, all the Barcelona players, you know, he, mm. he went and did it in Spain at the big, one of the biggest clubs in the world, you know, he was, um, and he went from QPR to Barcelona. I don't think that's going to happen again in a rush, no, is it? But, uh, and the great thing about that was, as well, Theo, that, he, he took the two players. He didn't didn't take loads of players. He took Gary Lineker and Mark Hughes, and that yeah. that showed also not the ruthlessness, but that he, you know, he wasn't mess, he wasn't messing about. Yeah, I mean, he knew, he was a fantastic judge of players, and players wanted to play for him. Mm. I mean, you know, he, he he didn't take a lot of persuading because they enjoyed playing for him more than most because they totally respected his ability as a coach, a sophisticated, really. I mean, they said he was like way ahead of, of other coaches. Mm -hmm. Gary Neville came out and said that today. He was very young when he played for him, you know. Um, but at the same time, yeah, he was good to the players. He didn't treat, he treated them like grown-ups. That was the thing. And that all came from, you know, he was part of that Chelsea uh, group mm -hmm. that, that Tommy Doherty fell out with in the 60s. And he suspended yeah. them for like many, many games because they all went out. And, well, they broke uh, a curfew, didn't they? They broke a curfew and he suspended like half the team, the, you know, some of his best players for weeks on end. And Venables was was very clear about what he thought was a good and a bad decision. He thought that was a, such an incredibly stupid decision. You're yeah. cutting off your Knows to to spite your face, you know, and the, the team went on a terrible run, yeah. and he became. I don't know if that was part of it. That was part, of, but as a manager, he was the opposite. He he let players uh, make their own decisions, and then they yeah. would have to stand by the consequences, you know. And when they when they did all that, I'm sure you you you, you talked about the well. I heard no, you no, talking about the, the the dentist chair. I heard you oh, talk about yeah. it, but he stuck with them. He stuck with them over all of that. And, of course, in the end, he, there was a sort of vindication when they when they came good, you know, when Gaza scored that goal and did the celebration and everything. And, and you know, Venables, I think he knew that you also, you have to be pragmatic as a manager. What is the point of hanging out all your players, hanging them all out to dry, when mm. you've got a tournament to go and play and hopefully, you know, and try and win? It, it's, uh, it's silly. And also, he felt they were all grown-ups. And they appreciated that because footballers are often treated, certain managers, I mean, they're still around, that's for sure. It's not just old-fashioned managers. Treat players like um, like children or, or inmates. And he never did that. And they loved him for that. Yeah, no, th th they certainly did. And, and he, he'd let them go so far and what have you. But he knew... He knew really how to get the best out of all of them. And uh, mm. the, when when he wanted, and I'm sure your dad found out a, a lot more about this, Howard, as well, as, you know, as you've already talked about that, when he really wanted to connect with certain players and talk to them and uh, make sure that they, they understood, you know, he was, he, he got it all laid out. They Whatever question they asked him, he was there, he knew. And I remember he, he, when we sat, we used to have, we had lunch once a month, every month up until the the Euros, and I was very fortunate, and uh, just he and I. And um, he he often used to say to I mean he, he he made me I told this story earlier where he made me sort of put on the napkin of the different place we stayed at, who he'd start the Euros with, and there was only one name the first time we met, and it was I couldn't guess it. It was Gary Neville. If they were all fit, this includes your Gazza Shearers and everything. It was it was Gary Neville best right back he'd ever seen in his life hard intelligent but could also make sure that he could just look at the uh, the the back line uh, when i needed him to whether they were playing three five two or whatever it was he said that gary neville meant that he could release gaza further forward in the, that championship and that's why neville if he was fit was going to play straight away and um you know, from 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 that point of view, I think there was unfinished business for him, Howard, in 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 some respects. But he, like with most things, he was able to sh shrug and, and move on. He was, and um, do you know what, um, Mark, um, a guy that I got to know quite well again through my parents, because my mother had a, sh a shop in Streetly Village in Sutton Colford, and a lot of the Aston Villa. Uh, wives used to go and shop there and so she became very good friends of Alison Southgate who's Gareth's wife yeah and of course Gareth missed that key penalty in the Euro 96 semi-final but he could not speak highly enough of how Terry handled that afterwards yeah yeah he was so good and kind to him 
and looked after him so well. And I think that's a testament to exactly what the sort of manager he was, yeah. like Fier touched on. He was a brilliant man manager, yeah. brilliant manager of men. You've got 30 seconds each to talk to me about today's game. Theo, first of all. <laughs> Disappointing. Uh, I thought we played some fantastic football, but of course our team's had the guts ripped out of it by injury and suspension. And uh, Another big one today yeah. early on in that game as well. Well, that was a uh, pretty shocking challenge, <laughs> you know, on a guy who's just come back after nine months and the, that went down extremely badly. Um, yeah, uh, so we've just not had any luck these last three games. Some people might say we had a lot of luck in the first eight or nine games, so fair enough, maybe it evens itself out, but uh, it was it was tough to take today. You've got 20 seconds, Howard. Well, um, it was a great win, a great game. It was like a basketball match, end to end. Two fantastic teams to watch. Um, Villa keep going, but Spurs are great and they'll come again. Two great teams, two great clubs. Theo Delaney, Howard Hodgson, thank you very much as always uh, here on the Sunday Nightclub. Chris Ramsey, Tony Incenso, Terry Venables and Queen's Park Rangers. He was big at that club too. That's next on the Sunday Night Club. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Coming Monday, Julia Hartley Brewer is back. The no-nonsense queen of talk TV is in a new time slot, but still telling it like it is. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. It's almost like they're highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing, is it? Don't miss her brand new mid-morning show every weekday from 10 a.m. That's my job. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. Talk TV for the stories that matter. This is Talk TV. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a minute. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast ah, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing an interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. 
Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. This is Talk TV. People of Britain, do you fancy a good dose of common sense before bed? Because the Independent Republican Mike Graham is now in prime time. We still cover all the stories that matter and put the world to rights. We just do it a little bit later on. So don't miss the Independent Republican Mike Graham Monday to Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Right after Piers Morgan Uncensored. Yes, the revolution will be televised. I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and Radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. We're talking about the life of Terry Venables tonight and uh, we've uh, had some fascinating insight and some great stories and celebrating that life as well. It's very sad, the news that Terry died last night at the age of 80 after what was a long illness in the end, but uh, he touched many of us and uh, virtually every football supporter in the, the last three generations at the very least and very much part of his magnificent career was as a player in the 60s and as a manager in the 80s at Queen's Park Rangers, of course. And uh, Tony Incenso is uh, going to be joining us uh, right now. And then Chris Ramsey, Queen's Park Ranger technical uh, director, uh, will also be with us in a while. Um, Tony, good evening to you. Uh, Terry and uh, Queen's Park Rangers was uh, a great fit twice. Yeah, it's a very, very sad day today. We're all in mourning as a Queen's Park Rangers family. Uh, it's, it's, it's terrible news. We knew, privately, I knew he hadn't been well. And um, just the news hits you, doesn't it? I mean, I first came across Terry Venables. He was manager, uh, but before that, he was a great player for Queen's mm -hmm. Park Rangers, the number four in the midfield. I had my first season ticket there in 1973. QPR won promotion, 72-73. He was the captain. He masterminded that success. And Rangers went on under Gordon Jago to do well in, in the top flight. And uh, a great, great player. Um, he was only 30 years old in those days, but he used to hold training sessions, he used to keep the other players back after training and coach them. And he devised really crafty free kick routines. I can remember one home game against Coventry, where Coventry playing in, in, I think it was in green and black stripes. And they lined up a five-man wall. Terry Venables comes up with the free kick just puts his foot under the ball and scoops it over the wall and Jerry Francis comes running from nowhere and scores for Rangers and uh, Terry Venables fantastic so those were my first memories of him as a player but he cut his managerial teeth at QPR as well he certainly did were you working by that stage as a broadcaster no I was um in the 70s I was at school and then in the 80s he, he became manager in 1980 and I was, I was at uh, I was still at school by then and um he had, a, he had a great uh, managerial career at QPR over four years. I mean, the first thing I remember, 1981, he instigated that old plastic pitch, the world's first plastic... God, football. forgotten about that at Loftus stadium. Road, yeah. The Omniturf. Now, um, he had a, a meeting with the chairman, Jim Gregory, and, and Jim Gregory's going, shall we put this down? Because the pitch was always waterlogged there. And uh, Terry Venable said, look, there are no rules against it. And, and Jim Gregory was saying, well, uh, you know, the football authorities won't like this. Terry Venable said, no, let's let's go for it. That clip you're showing at the moment was from the Russell Harty show. He, he sang uh, Making Eyes at Me on Russell Harty's show and all the QPR players were in the audience there. That was a very, very famous clip that I watched. But yeah, he yeah. put the Omniturf pitch down, which was like playing on concrete. I can remember the first game was against Luton in 1981. And at the end of the game, I just stepped over the barriers to, um, to have a look at it for myself. Uh, my own pitch inspection and I just jumped down three feet and I almost broke my ankle it was so hard it was like playing on concrete but everybody at Rangers said it was really great and it was for the technical players but, but we went on with great success that first season on the Omniturf 81-82 QPR got to the FA Cup final amazing for a second division club a championship club now to get to the FA Cup final and the day where we played um, West Brom Albion in the semi-final at Highbury was incredible uh, 25,000 Rangers fans there all packed on the North Bank 
And Terry Venables, he was wary of West Brom because they were doing really well in the top flight and Cyril Regis was banging the goals in and he was getting into the England squad. So Terry Venables pulled off a tactical masterclass that day because he played with no strikers. He had uh, Clive Allen and Simon Strainwood up front. So he told them to stay out on the touchlines the whole game. And so the big West Brom defenders, John Wilde and Ali Robertson, they didn't know what to do. They had nobody to mark. And so eventually Clive Allen scored the winning goal and there were tremendous celebrations. And then the final itself at Wembley against Spurs, 1982 FA Cup mm-hmm. final. This was when the FA Cup final meant something. Yeah. You know, it was the biggest game in world football. And QPR held Spurs to a one-all draw. And then we lost the replay 1-0. Very, very unlucky. Had a goal disallowed, hit the crossbar and so on. The following season, 82-83, clear champions of the second flight, which would now be the, the, the championship. Rangers yeah. won the championship and went up to what would now be the Premier League. And the following season, the success continued, finished fifth and qualified for Europe. Again, unprecedented for a newly promoted club to do that. And at the end of that season, that 1983-84 season, the last game of the season, I think it was against West Brom, the Terry Venables went out on the pitch at the end with a microphone and thanked all the fans. Said, We've got a great future together. We're going to build this club. And then about a week later, he got an offer, which he couldn't turn down, no. to go to Barcelona and manage Barcelona, and he left. And can you imagine a QPR manager nowadays going to manage Barcelona? But Terry was so good, and every single player, I interview all the players from that era for my QPR programme colleagues, every single player from that era says that Terry Venables was the best coach, technical coach, they ever had. And every day at training was like a, a lesson. They'd learn something every single day, Mark. Mm. Um some great memories uh, Tony thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, this evening Uh, Chris Ramsey of course who is Queen's Park Rangers technical director is um, also with us right now Uh, Chris uh, sad day but a day to celebrate as well and Terry would want us to celebrate I know that he was he was such a coach wasn't he such a good coach yeah I mean outstanding I think he did so much for the English game I think he was copied by many, many, and uh, he proved also to be one of the shining lights of coaches, English coaches, great English coaches that went abroad. I mean, he went to Barcelona before. Everybody looks at how Barcelona play now, um, and, and, and I know a lot of the stuff that he did there was stuff that helped to form the the the, 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 the legends that that there are there now. I mean, Terry was a shining light for all of us as coaches. Yeah, I mean, he really was, wasn't he? But he, but we were talking earlier about, you know, when he looked at who he could, he had there. He knew that uh, he'd got European quality, and then it was only Gary Lineker where he helped change Gary Lineker's career, really, in many ways, didn't he? And uh, Mark Hughes, he didn't just go uh, come back and raid for 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 any reasons, did he? He just knew the players that he wanted. Something that perhaps one or two of the modern managers now with such big squads, are, that, that there is this scattergun approach at times. It never was with Terry. Yeah, I think Terry was one of the, 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 the coaches that actually made players better. You know, he was the epitome of player development at a high level. And um, when you look at his tactical now, you talk to any of the players that would have played with him, we, we think that the, the coaches now have good tactical now. But, I mean, I think he was one of the forefathers of that. Mm. No, he, I mean, he certainly was. And at, at the same time, it was a shame in many ways. I think uh, they were for other uh, matters that he never continued his career with England, of course. But uh, a, a lot of those players, when you talk to them too, Chris, and you'll know a a lot of them. Les Ferdinand was in that squad, wasn't he, with course, uh, Terry yeah, yeah. Uh, for, for England as well, that uh, he, he made such a, a, a real difference. Yeah, I mean, Les always talks highly about Terry's uh, knowledge and how he could quickly get his point over. You know, he was very, very charismatic, but strict on, on, on uh, at the same time as well. So people respected him, respected what he did. And, um, and we also forget that he had a very illustrious career as, as a player himself you know he played for uh, every standard he played as, as an amateur for England as well as uh, going through the tw- under 23s and, and and the main team yeah he got a couple of caps as well yeah for the full England side and and as a player at Queen's Park Rangers Tony Incenso was was talking us through as well that you know at, at some 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 good times for Queen's Park Rangers and then to follow that on as as manager I mean you, not many managers go from Queen's Park Rangers uh, as uh uh, and then straight on to one of the greats of Europe, Barcelona. 
absolutely fantastic. And that, you know, and like I said, he, he was very straight talking and he, he very charismatic. And we also forget, you know, he had one of the, the, the best Crystal Palace teams back in the day, you know, with some of the really good young players that, you know, that came out to, yeah. to, to play for England. He had Kenny Sansons and Vince Hilaire's and people like that. So his, his career was almost second to none, really. Yeah, it, it certainly was, and he he will be remembered by all of us. I, I think as well that uh, you've been a great coach, uh, a lot with youngsters as well. Do you think that uh, the part of all of this is instinct that you you've really got to know the game inside out because. Um, he wasn't a flippant man. He was really serious about this side of things, and he was always thinking. Yeah, I mean, he 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 had some really good ideas. I mean, based on on a good on a good foundation, you know, he had mm. a lot of people around him to 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 bounce off your Ron Greenwoods and Dave Sexons and people mm. like that. So that was that was an era of very good coaches for for the English game, and uh, Terry was also up there. With, with um Malcolm Allison and those those type of people very charismatic very good understand the game um at a, at a good level and also understood young players as well yeah i think that's the thing he did understand the players didn't he he was he could be down to earth uh as he was an awful lot of the time he knew when uh, he could enjoy himself and they could enjoy themselves too yeah uh, and he he treated certainly as as we've already heard tonight. You know when uh, Gareth Southgate missed that penalty in the in the Euros and everything. Terry wasn't ever going to blame anybody for any of that sort of thing. Here was a here was a, a a guy that understood the game through and through. Yeah, I mean Terry was one one of these people that that you know he's going to bounce back. So he realised that failure and 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 uh, disappointment are going to be part of the game. Mm-hmm. And the way he embraced that is what made him what he was really because he, he understood that you you're not always going to be successful but his ideas were very very modern at the time and and we look at some of the ideas of the coaches now and we we, we look back there and you know he, he would have been ahead of 90 99 percent of the coaches that are here now just based on tactics and understanding of development one one of the things when uh, i got to know him when he was england coach that that i always found was very impressive is that he he knew in his own mind what he wanted very early on. He could sort things out, and and therefore he had this ability uh, not to panic about anything. Yeah, I mean, I think when you know and you, you're happy with the, with the players that you've got, and sometimes you pick players and people raise their eyebrows. That you know, a sign of a great coach because when it works, people tend to t- tend to think, you know, how how did you do it, and have you got any magic formula? But I think he was very straight. And, and, and very simple in the way that he delivered his messages and also the way that he treated people and treat, treated the players. You know, he, he, he was never going to get his, the wall pulled over his eyes because of the way he was as a person. We always talk about people, whether they can cross the generations. With footballers, it's very difficult because the, there's all sorts of things that are totally different from one generation to the next, whether it's physicality, whether it's all of the equipment, whether it's the pitches and what have you. But mm. I have a feeling that somebody like Terry Venables would have fitted into the modern game too. I think I think he was the modern game all the way through his career. And I don't think that he would have been out of place anywhere. anywhere. I mean, I think that people will look back at Terry and actually still maintain some of his ideas and ideals. Yeah, I think you're you're right, um, Chris. Thank you very much indeed for joining Anytime. us. I know I know that uh, we were going to talk tonight, and and we certainly are in the coming weeks about the the youngsters coming through and uh, and the, the apprenticeships and all that side of thing, which you're, you're going to be very much yeah, part of. Just one final thing on on Terry. Do you think that it was? Um, it, it was a shame that he didn't carry on for me after the Euros because I think those players missed something in a way that that he'd started that they'd all latched onto. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a shame. I mean, and, but but I think he did so well at that time, and sometimes it's, it's good to leave people wanting more. Mm. Um, but but he's been a, a loss to the game really um, with his ability and his ability to teach other coaches to to have flair and and charisma and believe in your players and treat people in a way that's going to get the best out of them. Chris Ramsey, thank you very much indeed for joining us tonight to talk about 
uh, the life and times of the great Terry Venables who uh, died yesterday at the age of 80. Uh, Alan Harris was Terry Venables' assistant at Barcelona, at Queen's Park Rangers, at Crystal Palace. And his son, John Harris, who knew both of them together so well, joins us next. It's the world's number one interview show, the new global home of big debates and big questions. This is really unfair. Why? We'll explain why. For all the big names. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. You're going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, of course, I cannot continue my work. Did you feel Elvis was a controlling influence on you? And the good news? You've already found it. All new Piers Morgan Uncensored, right here, Monday to Thursday, 8 p.m. This is Talk TV. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a minute. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast ah, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. This is Talk TV. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. <laughs> this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. After nine o'clock tonight, we'll be joining Kevin Buckland, uh, Everton uh, statistician, who uh, obviously uh, talk on what happened at Goodison Park today, both on and off the pitch. And Connor Aspel, United Faithfuls, will join us for that as well. And Fulham play Wolves tomorrow night. And Simon Duke and Dan Hughes uh, will be with us uh, to look at that. And uh, Horsham, who got a reprieve 
and are back in the FA Cup. And uh, they um, uh, are in action now, having uh, thought that they'd uh, missed out, but the side that uh, beat them uh, have played an uh, ineligible uh, player. And um, Kevin Borrett, the uh, chairman of Horsham, has uh, now got a second chance. He'll be joining us a little later on too. And Keith Hackett and Mark Halsey with uh, referee news and also their thoughts, obviously, of Terry Venables, who uh, died last night at the age of 80. I'm going to speak to um, John Harris now, whose father, Alan, um, was very much part of Terry Venables' career alongside him at uh, Barcelona, at Queen's Park Rangers, at Crystal Palace. He played at QPR as well, had uh, Alan. And uh, I have to also say, John, um, that uh, your dad played a few games for my club, Cambridge United, towards the end of his career before he went to Hayes. He did. He did indeed. But, right at the very end. Yeah, right at the very end. But before all of that, I mean, there was two things. He, You know, there was a player first before we talk about it and Terry Venables, but the two of them were so close. You, you've got to remember, they were friends from 15 years old. And uh, I think to, to go through all the time that they had together in, in as players and in management, um, it, it's hard. But they were. It's, it's one thing having an assistant that you trust, but having a, a good mate alongside you, um, yeah, I think it's a big bonus. You know, they, they, they used to bounce ideas off of each other. And uh, I, I never really heard them have crosswords. They'd debate things. My dad would... Uh, say what he thought and Terry would sometimes take it on the chin or uh, or express his views and it seemed to work very well. Oh, no, I absolutely did. Of course, let, to put all of this into context as well, you're, the Harris family, your family, of course, is steeped in football history because your dad's brother, Ron, of course, was a great player with Chelsea too. Well, I was, I was very privileged to grow up in a family where my dad was a professional footballer, my uncle was a professional footballer, Terry was like a second dad to me, um, and my other uncle was a, a professional speedway rider, so the whole family was quite competitive, um, and uh, there, was always, there, there was always something going on, there was always plenty of laughter around. I always found with Terry, and, and uh, I only really get, got to know him well, was when he was England manager, and uh, um, uh, up building up to the Euros, and then we kept in touch uh, for a long time. And uh, I was, uh, I found him fun, I found him interesting. I, I found that he always was looking ahead to, to think of other things and what have you. And I think that made him such a progressive coach, don't you? I think well, the remarkable thing about Terry, and one of the reasons I believe he was one of the greatest coaches and managers, was that he loved people. Um, be it sitting in, in, in his pub with his dad, Fred. He would listen to people. He'd pinch their one-liners. He always liked good stories. Um, and he was always surrounded by big characters. He was never intimidated by that, Terry. So he would learn little things from them and take them and use them somewhere else. And uh, his mind never sat still. He was always thinking of the next thing. I mean, just uh, before he started at Barcelona, just after the QPR uh, got to the cup final in 82, I was on holiday with Terry and his family and we went to America and Terry kept replying to every question in Spanish, which was quite annoying at the time. And I said to him, why, why, are you, why do you keep going on in Spanish? And he said, where do I go? Where am I going to go from here, from Queen's Park Rangers? He said, where's, where's the heights? He said, it's either going to be in Spain or Italy. So Terry learned to speak pretty good Spanish even before he went to Barcelona, not that he let anyone know that. Yeah. So when he went to the interview, he was actually listening to some of the other directors expressing their concerns even before questions were asked of him. And um, well, it worked because he got the job. And that was typical of Terry. He was always thinking one step ahead. Although it didn't work well because uh, my dad, when they went over to Barcelona, they got some tutors there. And within two weeks, Terry was fluent. And it made my dad look an absolute idiot. And he said to Terry, you know, you've got to stop now. He said, you've got to tell him that you can speak Spanish. And Terry used to pull his leg by holding conversations with directors in Spanish and then turning to dad and going, what do you think? Do you agree with that or not? <laughs> so they were always, always bouncing off each other. You know? What, what I, I always thought, and, and you would know so much more, not just as a second dad to you, but working with your father as well, Terry had Im immense respect for people that, and he, and as you mentioned, he was such a good listener, but he sort of, he chose a lot of the right people for the job that he was best at, which was football. 
he had a great ability. It wasn't like as a manager he was a disciplinarian or anything like that. He had this great ability. I mean, even as a young lad, I used to phone him from school if I had a problem or what have you, of making the problem diminish. He would he would talk you through things yeah. and you'd come out and think, actually, I'm not bad at this. No, that's, that's not a big problem at all. And I think he was like that with everyone. If you mm. talk to all the players at any of the clubs, mm. it wasn't that he told them what to do. He'd pick the best player he thought and he'd make them believe they were fantastic and in all their own abilities, and they would buy in to his belief. And as I say, he would talk to everyone. He would never, he would, you know, he was never flashing that sense, Terry. No. He would chat to anyone. And I think um, people liked his company, got the best out of people that way. Oh, I mean, when, when he had that job of England, and I was very new, well, Sky News was very new, and I was sports, and we'd started a programme called Sports Line, and... Uh, very early days and just to sort of put it all into context now if you're an England coach like Gareth Southgate you will go to a press conference and there'll be 120 cameras mm. and and the world's yeah. media in those days it was um, regional television BBC football focus for Terry's um, press uh, press conferences to the media and the new boys on the block which was me at Sky News Sport and then all the the press writers number ones used to meet them in Bisham Abbey down the pub and the corner where they'd all have a good lunch together. But we uh, I was saying earlier on that we went out once a month you know, for 18 months, basically up to the Euro 96s, and I got to know him really well. And he wanted to know what what I knew about football um, after I, I, I tried to call him out early, very at the first press conference about... Uh, some of the other dealings that were, were now simmering with uh, Alan Sugar and Spurs and all the other stuff going on. And um, I thought he was a brilliant listener. Definitely, definitely. He wanted to know, as you say, what you thought. He would listen to your ideas. Um, he'd always have an opinion on them, which is usually based on some facts that he might know or what have you. Um, but he wouldn't dismiss anyone out of hand like that because he was always curious about what you had to say. Yeah. And he took that and, you know, you've, you've got to remember when he went to Barcelona, he went from a Division Two club oh, yeah. in England to, you know, what we consider the greatest club in the world. And within two weeks had convinced all these established internationals um, a completely different way of playing football. I mean, you know, this is 50 years ago. No one heard of pressing from the front and yeah. stuff like that. I think Pep Guardiola was in the under-15s when he was there. Um, this, was, this was way ahead of the game back then. And within two weeks... He had them all totally yeah. believing this was the way forward and, and they had a great year that year. I don't know if we've got a shot of that picture of Terry in Barcelona that we were... Go, we're we're going to find this for you because there's a 15-year-old Pep Guardiola in this picture, oh, really? actually, which, is, which is quite fascinating. The boys are just going to find that one up. But um, th this was this was the thing. Nothing phased him, did they? And, I, and uh, obviously yeah. your dad as well. You can't kid anybody when you grow up with them, can you? No, and I, this is what I'd, I'd never. Terry was always very confident um, in his ideas, but he was never, you know, arrogant in any way. No. And I think Dad and Terry balanced each other out. You know, Dad would always tell him what he thought, um, and I think Terry liked that. He always appreciated, as you say, people's opinions, and they trusted each other as friends. That was the difference. Yeah. Um, so, did you go over to Bar? Did you live in Barcelona yourself? There's a picture. There, just to let everybody know who what's watching on Brilliant. television. Uh, apologies, yep. apologise if it's uh, if it's just on radio. But but there they are, and just uh, bottom left in that picture. Uh, 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 can we see it? There is um, there he is. That just down there below the guy on the on the w w with the the two red guys that are holding Terry aloft, and then there's another little boy there. That's a fifteen year old. Oh, really? That's yeah, yeah, yeah. That is yeah. Pep Guardiola. <laughs> that's amazing, isn't it? Really? It's, it is incredible, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's it's a fantastic incredible. picture to find. Well done, boys. That's uh, Chris and Porrick in the team behind. Uh, um, with me uh, here, but so you know, when you when you went out there, and then all of the other thing, it was very much um, uh, football. But the loyalty that t Terry had with your dad was was a loyalty as well that he showed to his his agent and his his friends, uh, Eric and uh, and everybody else, and all of those that he surrounded himself with. So one of the greatest things about Terry is I always, I always like people that will always cross a room and say hello to you no matter where you are. And um, 
Terry always stayed in touch with all his old friends, um, and he was always surrounded by big characters. Uh, people like Bobby Keach, who was, who was one of my heroes as a man, he was a hilarious man. Um, and but Terry would would mix with these people. We could be at Scribe singing, but he'd have his friends there that he went to school with, like Peter Algram, people <laughs> like that. Um, and that's what was impressive about him. You know, if he if if he liked you and trusted you, that was it. I he mean- never lost touch. We had a we had a we had a big Christmas party in Scribes one year for Sky News Sport and and some big stars at the time as well. But uh, it was really for the team. And uh, I asked Terry if we could use Scribes, and he said sure. And I said, you know, if there is an opportunity that you could pop in for five minutes, it would be terrific. And he said. I'll, I'll do what I can. And, you know, he spent a couple of hours talking, not to the Roger Utleys, the Kenny Sansoms, the others so much, he obviously said, but he, he spoke to every single one of our team, whatever they, they, they did within the television sports team there. And, and that, for me, was a mark of the man. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, he wouldn't miss the opportunity to have a song as well. He oh. did like a sing song. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we forget we forget all that side of him. He he got to number twenty three in the charts with a Presley number, and a band. Right, a good voice. We've had many a Christmas party uh, with the piano, um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was he had a good voice. Yeah, he was a good author. Um, and I think well, was it. It was interesting about the author. He's Gordon Williams, who was an amazing author, who, yeah. who wrote Siege on Trench's Farm, and was a, a great character worked well with Terry and liked Terry because Terry had this ability, as I say, to mix with people, to pick up one-liners, to notice features, and he brought those characters to life. And it made, Gordon always thought it made it so much easier because he'd come up with a plot and, you know, there might be people involved. And Terry would take that and rewrite some of the way they speak or what have you. And it's quite funny reading, if you read some of the Hazel books, mm. although the names were changed, you think, I oh, know exactly who he's, who he's talking about there and what have you. you know, it's, it, was, it was quite funny. But he was brilliant at that. And I think that's, what, again, why he was such a good coach. He had that great ability to talk to people um, and have an empathy with them in ways that they understood mm. and make them believe that they were perfectly capable of doing all these things. Well, let's just uh, we, we, just stay with us here. We're going to just hear a little bit of Terry's vocal dexterity too. Please let my dream come true. Oh, I heard him sing more than once down at uh, Scribes uh, as well. Yeah, my favourite was Whatever Happened to Lucy. I think that was a record he bought out first on yeah. a Decca label. Yeah, yeah, no, there was quite a few of it with with all of that. And um, but he, he he was a he was a he was a superstar really in many ways as well, wasn't he? He was a good looking yeah, bloke. I think I think, he, I think he could have been an actor as well, you know. He's one of the few people I've ever met in my life that could have... He would have been successful at whatever he set his mind to. He's, he's just multi-talented. And even as a young player, you know, I mean, when they were coming through mm. um, and uh, Ted Drake was bringing through all these young lads, Terry always had an opinion about something, which probably drove Tommy Doherty round the bend. But it wasn't <laughs> that he was testing him or being argumentative. He just always was pushing the boundaries to improve or to bring something else into the game. And... Uh, I think if you talk to some of the players like George Graham or, or that, mm. they would say he was always going to be more than just a footballer. And I think yeah. Malcolm Allison was probably the first to notice it and said, you know, he, he was a good player, but he was a much better manager. And he said he'd go on to be a much better manager. Um, I was always sad when, uh, you know, he, he stood up for himself when uh, it was before, actually, the Euro 96, when the International Committee at the FA under chairman Noel White, decided that he wasn't the sort of man they thought they needed going forward with one or two other uh, well-documented uh, court appearances that were going to happen and, and what have you. But I, in many ways, I think that was a shame. And, and uh, interestingly, we were talking earlier in the show about this, that these days, uh, Terry Venables would have, would have completed a proper job over many years with England, you know, if it was today. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I think if you asked any of the players in that squad, they would have wanted him as a manager. Oh, well, it's but because of what we've talked That's... about here is how not only could he talk to them, he he gave them 
uh, the opportunity to show that they proved that they were grown ups. He knew when they could have a bit of fun. He knew as well that it wasn't always about being strict, but he was at times. And um, and we were talking earlier about the dentist chair and everything on that trip to Singapore on the plane coming back. But um, there was method in all of that with him as well, wasn't there? Yeah, I think he allowed characters to grow. I think, as I say, he expected them to be professional. He treated them as professionals. And um, in all sport, if you talk to any sportsman, there's always a, a story of a, a night out that goes wrong or what have you. I mean, even up at, um, at Blackpool with Chelsea, you know, a few of them were, were sent home. That happens. But yeah. if you've got a team of characters um, that are strong-minded, that's going to happen now and again. The trick is handling that, and I think Terry was brilliant at doing that. Yeah, so I remember the... Um... When I, I saw, I was with Graham Taylor actually at, at the time, and Terry, I was in in Holland at, at a, a Dutch game, and just noticed then that he wasn't quite the Terry that he was, and 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 Graham Taylor turned to me and just said, "I hope, I hope heading a football or whatever hasn't got to him." It's, sort of, I mean, I, I lost my dad um, mm. to dementia, and yeah. uh, it's a it's a dreadful thing. Uh, I mean. You know, bless them, Yvette and Nancy, Tracy and Sam's mm -hmm. grandson and, and, and Dixie's great granddaughter. Mm -hmm. you, you know, they, you're at a loss because um, if, you, if you're dying of an illness, you've got time to speak to people, sort things out. But you're kind of robbed of a few years uh, of not that person. And mm -hmm. it's just, it, you know, it was hard yesterday to lose such a great character, such a charismatic man, an intelligent man, because there's just not many people, I don't think they're allowed to be the sort of characters now. Um, and I don't think they'll replace people like Terry, I've got to be honest. Perfect. Thank you so much indeed for uh, sharing with us uh, your great man memories, John, of Alan, your dad and uh, Terry Venables. Hey, they'll be, uh, they'll be together having a little chat again now, won't they? <laughs> I should think there'll certainly be a bit more music going on. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for joining us on the Sunday Night Club. This is Talk TV. Coming Monday, Julia Hartley Brewer is back. The no-nonsense queen of Talk TV is in a new time slot, but still telling it like it is. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. It's that almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing, is it? Don't miss her brand new mid-morning show every weekday from 10 a.m. That's my job. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. 
Sunak and the current Conservative government are not Conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Very good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Well, I've really enjoyed the uh, last hour and uh, three quarters. Uh, as I said, 90 minutes plus extra time plus penalties with uh, uh, memories, great memories too, from uh, many people who knew Terry Venables, who sadly uh, died after a long illness. Uh, at the age of 80 yesterday in Spain, which is uh, where he made his home and retired as well uh, in Spain, in the Alicante region. And uh, a great man and a, and a good friend to me as well in uh, this difficult career at times of being a sports broadcaster where you have to ask difficult questions. Um, also for referees as well, Keith Hackett and Mark Halsey, our two resident referees here on the Sunday Night Club. It's been busy. We'll talk about one or two of the decisions later on. But, gentlemen, good evening. Let's talk about uh, the late Terry Venables now. So good evening, Mark. Both, uh, did you, did you ever um, referee him as a player at all? Yes, uh, well, I, I, I ran the line oh, uh, of course. very early in my career. And... Um, I, I always remember because I think I got off to a very good footing with uh, with Terry because I gave a very dodgy throwing decision, and he looked in my direction, nodded his head, didn't scream, and just said, "I think you got that one wrong, Lino." Mm -hmm. And um, he always remembered that. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I really, really enjoyed is being in his company. A couple of things, really. First, I, I had the pleasure of refereeing the centenary game of the Football League versus the rest of the world, of which he managed one of the teams. Mm. And um, he came in, was very welcoming at the start, and said, look, no red and yellow cards, eh, Keith? And um, we got through the game. Yeah. And and he, he had to, of course, he had a, a, a huge squad of players, and therefore he had to make certain that they all played. I know that I know that Mr. Blatter was very unhappy with me for allowing so many substitutes. <laughs> I had a letter. You weren't from the him. first. You weren't the last. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to say. Just ask the West Ham fans. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, you're right. The thing, the thing that I remember, I, I sat um, also on a panel that judged the manager of the month when I was PGMOL mm. boss, and we used to have a really nice lunch before making the decision um and uh, on the other occasion i sat next to him and we talked football and other things mm -hmm. um you know he, he is one of the the players and managers of the past the one thing that he had mark was respect mm -hmm. and i think he earned it and he gave us respect as match officials mm -hmm. he had an understanding that the game was difficult mm -hmm. And he didn't scream his head off. Um, I think he had a nice way of putting his comments across. Um, sadly missed for the game. And in a way, I just wondered, did he get the recognition that he deserved 
in 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 relation to the honours that I think the country should have bestowed upon him. Yeah, no, I, I don't think he did. Um, Mark, no. did you did you referee any of his sides? No, I think it was for my time, Terry, as as a manager and as a player. But I did. I mean, he played for my beloved QPR. I used to worship him when I used to go and stand in Loft, Loftus Road End when he used to play for us. Um, mm. I mean, what a player. I mean, fantastic. At the, you know, he just he was the conductor of the orchestra at the back there, just dictating everything, you know. And I mean, I used to love going there and watching him. And obviously, then he became he became our manager. I think he had a, a win ratio of about 49.9%, one of the best ever as a manager of QPR. Um, but also I also remember him uh, uh, Euro '96, where he actually lifted the country, yeah. got us, yeah. got us through to the semis, and we got knocked out by the Germans again on the on, on in the semi final. Was it on penalties? I think it was. It was because um, I was all booked to go at the final. I had all my tickets done and everything. You know, I mean everything done. But uh, I mean, obviously, he, he, I mean it's just up the road for me because I'm in the Alicante region. So, uh, yeah. but it's. Uh, I mean, it's just it's a it's a great shame, and I agree with people. I didn't think he got the recognition he got it deserved. I think from from perhaps the, the FA at the time um, for what he'd done for for his country. And I thought that picture of uh, Pep Guardiola just you know <laughs> when he's when he was aloft with on those two guys in the red, I thought was a fantastic. It'd be interesting to see if Pep remembered that. You know, if he yeah. comes out and he, he thinks so. And I thought uh, when you said oh, it was Pep Guardiola, I thought. What an absolute, what a, what a picture that was, you know, absolutely fantastic. Mm. And what a player, what a manager, mm. and from all accounts, what a person. Be sorely missed in, 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 in the world of football. Absolutely. And that's the, the perfect way to finish uh, our thoughts uh, here on the Sunday Night Club with Terry Venables, who was a very good friend to me uh, as well. And um, let's talk more, if we may, gentlemen, about uh, the situation of where we were. I watched my side Cambridge United yesterday uh, at Northampton Town. It, it really wasn't our day. We didn't play very well. We had a sending off as well. But one of two of these decisions over the weekend, which I understand exactly why. The first was for a foul that was a bookable offence. And then within the minute, um, the descent from the same player over the top and sent off. I think that the player... Um, realised what he'd done after that, but it was too late. And that happened I, I, higher up as well in the games, didn't it, this uh, weekend? Yes. You yes. Know, so, so there are... Uh, I'm, not, I'm not unhappy with that sort of uh, decision if they are right and correct, two bookable offences. Yeah. Keith? Well, I think on, on the professional side, Mark, what we learned with Anthony Taylor was that he'd obviously given a decision that warranted a yellow card. But then what was interesting was that the player must have said something completely and utterly out of turn because he got a straight red. Mm. So he now faces not just a one-match ban, but a three-match ban. My advice always to referees is that, you know, when you're cautioning a player, ensure that you're not in their face. You've got a job to do, show the card, but then the best thing to do, Mark, is get out of the way. Mm. You know, I just think that referees today are hanging around the situation where players are frustrated. They don't agree with your decision. They want to let off a bit of that frustration. And referees remain there and therefore almost promote the mm, problem. Yeah, mm, I can see that. I, I think he's right. I mean, if you look at Dunk, he's, he, he, he's, he's walking away and Anthony then flashes yellow card to, to his back, to, to him. Yeah. Just slow it down, calm it down, call the player to you. Yes, he's frustrating. He's, you know, it's not all. It's, it's, you know, the referee's there to manage the game, manage the players, and manage the event. Because so I'm not, I'm not condoning Lewis Dunk's actions, but Anthony could have just slowed that all down and calmed it all down, and perhaps avoided that straight red card by putting him to one yeah. side and just and just speaking to him man to man, like we used, like we, like we, you, know, you, you can. You do, you do it now, you can do it in every game. As, as I keep saying, as it says, referees and art are not a science. Mm. Now, Look, I mean, now, at the end, end of the day, Mark, here, the, the, the problem is players are not making life easy no. for the referee. I mean, I, I watched the Manchester United game, and, and, and in fairness to referee John Brooks, he remained pretty calm throughout when he was being put under pressure. And, and I think that sometimes players just going down, rolling as though they're shot, 
add to the pressure of the referee. And the referee doesn't want to be seen to be weak. Mm. Against that, we've got the balance of Howard Webb uh, starting the season with a with a clamp down. There's no other word for it in terms of dissent. And then reinforcing that again this week by saying, you know, where a player shows a card, uh, imaginary card, then in that situation, another yellow card. The problem but, is but... that the game, the game is damaging itself because... We operated on an average of three yellow cards per game. Mm. We're now moving towards an average of five yellow cards a game. And so there's going to be lots of players not playing in shortly because you, they've, they've accumulated but, so cards. So, Mark, Mark, I could bring you in on this one. And a question, yeah, I want to talk. Yeah, I want, yeah, go on. Go on. A question with, with all of this. You can come back to that one as well. But one question to ask yeah. you from your recent refereeing. I feel a lot of the modern players spend most of their time with agents and people who are telling them that they can do and say and everything that they want because they're basically the one that they're all milking. I think they get onto the field and under the intensity of the battle and the game and what have you, I think they just feel that, that, that there are no consequences because there doesn't seem to be that many consequences away from the game for them. Uh, I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think you're right there. I think obviously that the salaries they're on today, I don't think that they're, 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 they're not they're not worried about if they miss a game or they miss two games or they miss three games. Mm. Um, but I, I, I think that going back to what what Keith was saying, um, I think the frustrations come from the accuracy and the decision making and the frustrations of of the non-accuracy in, in referees. I mean, I, I watched the same games he did today mm. and I thought John Brooks, that you, you look at the penalty that went to VAR or he cautioned mm. Marshy off for simulation. He's got mm. a great, uh, he's got a great angle. He's looking straight at it. It's a clear penalty, but he cautions him for, for simulation. simulation. And then he has to go to VAR for, for a review. Mm. A referee of that calibre should be picking that up. Yeah, yeah. I think we're and just. That's what, I think that's uh, what with with referees for not picking those those things up. Good. We just lost you for a little bit there, Mark, but we got yeah. the gist of it. Here's a question for both of you, Keith. Uh, a, a final thought on this little bit here. Um, with Everton in the situation they're now in, with mm. you know, it's, the, the, it's a totally different situation now. Uh, for their team and for everything with their... These games are going to be much more, in a, in a strange way now, intense, aren't they? And there's going to have to be real responsibility for the... If I, if I say it, having the, the, the better, calmer referees involved with some of these games? Yeah, you, you make a very good point, Mark. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, the difference between a referee in the park who's refereeing a football match, at the elite level, it is an event. And therefore, I think that referees have, they've got the time, they're professional, they have to go in prepared. Because clearly, the players have been punished by this deduction of points. And, and you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, there is a risk to their incomes because they're, they're in the relegation zone. Now, yeah, they can put that right, I think, but ultimately, it is a punishment of the players for something that they've not done. Mm. And therefore, I think that sometimes, you know, punishments come in. I, I generally believe that you make the observation spot on. You need, a, you need a calm referee. But then I think we yeah. need calm referees with confidence throughout the competition. Mm. And sometimes we're getting rush decisions, rush cards, and it's not conducive to setting a good example for grassroots level referees. Mark. And the confidence comes with the leadership and direction from from the management. And you, you you're right about your team sheets, Keith. You always put your your number one referees at the top of the team sheet. Yeah. Now this weekend, Michael Oliver had a week off. Why yeah, is a I professional can referee? That. Why is a professional referee having a week off? No. Why are they giving him a week yeah. off? Yeah. I mean, that's like saying to Pep Guardiola, Harlan's not playing next week. Mm. I'm going to give him a, a week off. You have you you have to have your best referees out week in week out. If you've got too many referees and they're all moaning they aren't getting appointments, then just reduce the number of the list. I did that. 
because I was confident that I got 10 quality referees, world class, that I could put on games. We're a bit short, and therefore Oliver, who is a, clearly our number one referee, mm. should be out every week. Mm. Shouldn't be doing VAR, shouldn't be doing fourth official roles, should be out in the middle, blowing the whistle and controlling it in the way that he does. Yeah, that's a good point, Mark, because that's that's what those who perhaps are thinking about becoming referees want to see. Yeah, yeah. We, well, I, mean, I mean, you learn from people like Michael Oliver. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just a, a, fi mean, a final point, both of you here. We've got we got a minute, so thirty seconds each. There was a bad <laughs> tackle today in that first game, uh, the Tottenham game, and and a player has yeah. been out for nine months, uh, basically out again. You, both of you, if I come to you first, Mark, you you could tell those bad tackles by the reaction, the proper reaction of player, other players, couldn't you? Yeah, I, I mean, listen, I don't think Villa could have had any complaints had he been shown a red card for that challenge. I thought it was a very, very poor challenge. Mm. Mm. Yeah, uh, I, well, I agree. I, I, I looked and thought, that's a straight red. You know, one of the things that we've got to take care of as referees is that we have a duty of care towards the players. And the players have a duty of care towards their opponents. And challenges like that, that are in the game, should be outlawed. He had, he had no and chance you should be the erring on the side of safety and giving the red card, not condoning it. Brilliant stuff as always, guys. Uh, that's Keith Hackett and Mark Halsey with their take. Gavin Buckland from Everton. Connor Aspinall from Manchester United after nine. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Cross Talk. One o'clock every weekday. People of Britain, do you fancy a good dose of common sense before bed? Because the Independent Republican Mike Graham is now in prime time. We still cover all the stories that matter and put the world to rights. We just do it a little bit later on. So don't miss the Independent Republican Mike Graham Monday to Thursday nights at 9 p.m. right after Piers Morgan Uncensored. Yes, the revolution will be televised. This is Talk TV. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your this ideologies? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? 
If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. This is Talk TV. Very good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and Radio, seven o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a gun. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at seven on Talk TV. Very good evening, yes. And uh, just to let you know that Had Hughes is uh, with you and The Unexplained from 10 o'clock on Talk Radio, as always, tonight. And there'll be uh, Peter Cardwell's uh, show on Talk TV. All of that to come here at 10 o'clock in the last hour of the programme. Later on, we're going to be speaking to Fulham, uh, chair of their supporters' trust, Simon Duke, and to Dan Hughes from the Wolves fan cast. The two of them meet tomorrow night. And uh, Horsch, having been reinstated to the FA Cup, Kevin Borrett, who uh, was on the show uh, after uh, their first round win, uh, will be with us to talk uh, how they've got a second chance uh, after they lost that uh, replay, I should say, in the uh, first round. All of that then to come, but let's start with uh, Everton at Goodison Park against Manchester United. The first game at Goodison Park since the deduction of 10 points uh, from Everton. It's, it's, the whole thing has not felt satisfactory in any sort of way for me um, on anything really because of what's happening elsewhere in the Premier League and with other clubs and, uh, and what have you and how this one... Um, has uh, gone the way it has, but it has gone this way, and Sean Dyche and the side have uh, somehow got to get those points back. Today they were beaten in the end by Manchester United by three goals to nil. I think it could have been uh, quite a lot closer than that. So let's uh, talk to Connor Aspinall in just a moment from the United Faithfuls and uh, Kevin Borrett, the. Uh, uh, no, it's Kevin was uh, George. It's Kevin Buckland with us uh, as well. Sorry about that, Kevin. And uh, to talk about exactly what's been going on with Everton, uh, which is uh, vitally important, Gavin. So um, you're the Everton statistician, if I could put it that way. You're the man. Uh, you would have uh, beforehand. The atmosphere was incredible as it was during the game. I understand completely the Evertonians and the way they feel. Um, but is, do you think anything is going to change or are you just going to have to continue as fans with the anger that you have inside? Um, I think it will depend on the outcome of the appeal. Um, Mark, as you know, there was a 10-point uh, deduction and my, I think the understanding is Everton will appeal, uh, appeal that decision and we await the outcome of that. But that needs to be done sooner or, sooner or later. Mm. Because as you remember, last time I was on was only a couple of weeks ago. We were talking yeah. about the ownership, with me. Yeah. And so there's 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 lots of stuff, and and the next set of financial accounts for all the Premier League clubs are due in December. So what will that will throw up? So we could get to January. We're talking to the Premier League about 21, 22 accounts, 22, 23 accounts, and the ownership. So there's lots of lots of stuff going on off the pitch. I think in the meantime, we just got to carry on as normal. I, I felt that, I'm not, I'm not just, just total, just my opinion. I thought yeah. the players were affected by the atmosphere today a little bit. You know, they look 
wraps up like a team that uh, you know that where, the, where the, this week had probably drained them a little bit. And uh, to be honest with you, and that was possibly reflected in reflected in our performance. That's a a really good point that you make there, and um, I think it just to come another one for you on that here. For, for players, uh, modern day players, um, yes, they uh, are professional. Yes, uh, with your manager, they've got to do what they can. And I, uh, uh, there was a couple of chances that you had after you'd gone one down to a sensational goal today where you, you, you just felt uh, on other occasions uh, they might well have been put away. It's not going to be easy for this squad, is it? Because there will be some amongst it that will be thinking... Well, you know, whether what happens now, we could easily go down and, and I'll be off, just being blunt about yeah. it. Yeah, well, also as well, we've got a few players in the final year of the contract as well, yeah. which is which is not ideal. And what's going to happen with that? But, 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 but a threadbare squad anyway. I mean, to be fair to the club, it's tried to rectify some of the financial difficulties had over the last few years. And, and so we are a threadbare squad. It, it, it can, you know, you've been around a long time, Mark. You know, these mm -hmm. things can either motivate people, can't they, the sense of injustice, or the people are demotivated by it, as you say. But, you know, it's not my fault uh, that we're in this position. Mm -hmm. As is, you know, I could be looking elsewhere. And so, it, it, though, though people don't probably admit it, but it, it, it probably does affect players. I'm just wondering if Everton were bottom of the league and Dice started having a go with the players mm. for not performing properly, the players could turn around and say, and I'm not, this is a hypothetical, no, it's no. not our fault we're here. We're not our fault we're here. Yeah. No, no. I, it's, I, it, it, it's, 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 you know, legitimately say that. It's not, you know, the, mm. it's not our performance we've got it there. It, it's, it's, it's previous financial difficulties that, mm. You know, some of the players weren't even there at the time, mm. and so yeah, it, it could it could take a while to play out. But this is that's what I'm saying. The sooner the appeal sorted, and the sooner we can, the sooner we can def, definitely know where we are, then I think we're all the better for it. Really, as are the other other clubs in the Premier League as well. Oh, I completely. To be fair. Well, no, I completely agree with that because I, you know one of those other sides down there. You know they, they that you know where Everton now are. They might think that they've escaped it, and then suddenly you have an appeal when it, if it came through right before the end of the season, suddenly you go back up the league again, and I mean the whole thing's a total mess. And Connor, you know even for Manchester United, you're in the middle of what is the, just a, like a long tooth extraction uh, with the Glazers, aren't you? Amongst other things. <laughs> We certainly are, and at the moment, that all, all that seems to be the uh, talk at the moment, even when we do win the games, that seems to be the main focus point. And obviously, this has been going on for over a year now. We passed that mark a couple of weeks ago, this uh, alternatives that they were looking at over a year ago, and we still don't have a clue what is going on, when this you know sort of mini takeover is going to happen, what week he's going to get the keys and make his decisions. So at the moment, that seems to be all we're talking about. Mm. Uh, you, you were talking about that Garnacho goal, though, weren't you, today? <laughs> I mean, that would be the, the best goal I've ever seen in my lifetime. I don't think I'll uh, surpass that one, for sure. I mean, you know, at, at the time it happened as well, Connor. I'll come to you first and then back with you as well, Gav, uh, Gav on that. Is that, you know, so early on in that game as well, there's Everton, the fans, and, and I, I, I can feel it from here, having been at Everton so many times, the great atmosphere that there, there will have been created today. And then that after a couple of minutes. That was, I think that for us to win the game today, especially to win it comfortably, that was, that was vital that we scored early and uh, scored first. And I mean, the, the level of the goal definitely flattened the, the stadium. You could, you could definitely mm. sense that, that the, that the home fans are definitely weren't expecting a moment like that. I don't think anybody was expecting a moment like that. I don't even think Garnacho, the man who scored the goal, was expecting <laughs> themselves to do that. That's just, you know, that's one of them goals where you look back at that in 10 years and think, you know, he's never going to do anything like that ever again. No, absolutely. Gavin, one thing with that as well, that, you know, if you're Sean Dyche, if you're the players at that stage, and perhaps it made them snatch on one or two chances that you had after that, you know, you've got, built yourselves up, you've got yourselves going, you're all as one, and then they score a worldie like that, and you know you've got to try even harder to get yeah. back in the game. Yeah, yeah, I, I get that. I just say I've been going to Goodison, dare I say, more than 50 years. Just <laughs> yeah. o just over 50 years. 
and, I, and I, can't, I, I can't I can't remember seeing a better goal than that on the ground and all that time brilliant it's as good I mean they compared it to Wayne Rooney so it was a better goal than Wayne Rooney well he shinned far, his didn't he yeah, it was the, it's the fact they had to run back two or three yards, had a bit of space, you know, pace, and then you know did the overhead kick. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely fantastic goal. Yeah, you're right, Mark. I think it 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 it's it, because of the atmosphere. I'm, I'm sure there was a lot more pressure on the players, mm. a lot more scrutiny on the players than perhaps even normal. And Man United's what with Liverpool is probably our biggest game of the season, mm. and, and I'm sure that affected the players in in key moments in, in the first half. You say we had three or four. What you, that old cliche Gil's heads chance. Yeah. yeah, a couple of them you and, were and, yeah. Yeah. And, and we 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 fluffed them really and, and you just knew it was gonna be one of those days and then they come out the, the start of the second half was like the start of the first half, wasn't it really? Mm. Bit quiet and United scored. But yeah, we had three or four and if you don't there was always a feeling at half time I thought we're gonna pay for this. Mm-hmm in the second half and and we did unfortunately i don't know how i mean i'm I'm thinking of myself now as a fan i don't know how that if if it was my club that had lost these points i turn up to every game when you get beat you're going to think well this is absolutely ridiculous you know we've got okay we could have got beat with 10 more points here we now got beat yeah with 10 less points here, you know this it it feels so much more unfair than just the 10 points isn't it yeah, it was always going to be a VAR penalty decision for oh. today, wasn't it? Just to, you know, get a VAR, you know, that that just that was just a cherry on the cake, wasn't it, of, of this week? Yeah. I mean, fortunately, I, I've only seen it once on replay. It looked like a a penalty, uh, to be honest with you. But that was yeah. that was just going to add to the sense of everything's g- ganging up on us, <laughs> and, and uh, that that was certainly the case. And I think that. You, you just knew at half time, I think, because you missed chances and yeah. Ganacho's goal. You think it, it's just going to be one of them weeks, and we've got to, we've got, we, you know, we've got to dig in again uh, next week because we've got a lot of difficult home games. We have. Uh, in December, we've got Chelsea, Newcastle, Manchester City all to come to Goodison, and we've got to go to away to Spurs. And um, so this was a game, with all due respect to Man United, but I know they've had a couple of these results where the general feeling was with Everton fans that we could get something from it. But um, spot on, I think the early goal just took the wind out of our sails off the pitch, I think. And um, then, as you say, that puts more pressure on us. There's more, let's face it, there's more pressure on you when you've got four points in the game than when you've got 14, isn't it? Well, also, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the bottom of the table now. You've got four points still. Uh, your goal difference is better. But, uh, suddenly the gap there now, I mean, sides like Bournemouth and Fulham and Forest, you know, they're they're eight points clear of you at the moment. That's three wins. Yeah, exactly. We go to Forest on Saturday as well. And, um, yeah, all of, the, whole, the whole thing's changed. I think I think there's a good point to be made, though, Mark, about is couldn't this just been sorted at the start of the season? Oh, yeah, I think... So, so, yeah. so you know what you're going into. Yeah. I think Dice may say... That if I'd be going into the start of the season at minus 10 points, you might have had a different approach to the first 10 games of the season or 12, yeah. whatever it was, 10, 12 games well, of the season there than is what, al- we, what we did. There, there is also, and it's this long running question with some of these other sides, and I'm, I'm talking here about Manchester City and others. Let's say they are eventually found guilty as well. It probably could have meant that you could have stayed up even by having 10 point deduction yeah i mean that's i mean this could take years though the, the chelsea and city cases are uh, city and chelsea cases are different to Evans. i One know of the, i mean i've read, I've read the, i don't know if you read the commission's report on ever i mean i must have read about 20 times it, yeah. it had but what is a straight, pretty straightforward case yes. really in legal they had forty thousand documents yeah. so can you imagine how many documents they've got for manchester city yeah, but that, that with, but that's you know. why it's going to be like a dickens novel and bleak house no, I, it's, I, it's going to be pushed down the road for so long that we you know perhaps none of us will even be able to get to every game by yeah, then yeah well absolutely and you know then so that the different cases and uh, there's a wider discussion here about the increased legal side of football ultimately is just going to lead to chaos isn't it it is and really. we're going to come on and talk about that yeah on another occasion we're going to give a a, a proper show yeah. to that and we'll we'll definitely have you 
back on with that. A, a thought of Manchester United, though, now, and the pressure on Manchester United every week. And let's talk about the football, first of all. That's an important win for you going into this busy period now, isn't it? However you get it. Yeah, that was a first half, I thought, especially we weren't we weren't at it at all. Obviously, after the goal, I think we sort of, and Ten Hag said after the game that the players thought that that was done and he had a word with them at half-time. And I thought second half, they came out much brighter and looked a lot better in the second half. But that was an important win ahead of what is a really, really crucial week. Obviously, that game on Wednesday night away at Galatasaray isn't going to be easy by any imagination. And then the small task of going to Newcastle at the moment, which it seems to be a real difficult place to go, as Chelsea showed on the weekend. So mm. it's a really big week ahead of a really big month, especially. One thing that um, I disagreed with, with quite a lot on X this week is uh, there was the Liverpool and everybody everybody at Liverpool seemed to be moaning about uh, how many games they've got and the, with the players and the injuries and everything. If you're successful in the Premier League, you know you're going to get all of this. This is just the way it happens. So you must take that into account, surely, when you buy these players in the first place, that you, you, you think twice, you know, if I've got somebody possibly coming from Brazil or I've got somebody else coming from Europe uh, and they're of similar standard or whatever, you, you have to think about that when you're buying these players. You can't start moaning about it when you've, you've bought the best from around the world. Of course they're going to go back and play for their clubs and their countries. Yeah, and the, the biggest clubs have the have the biggest budgets in order to deal with those sorts of 60, 70 game seasons. And then the problem yeah. that I think with those fans is you look down towards League One and League Two, those teams have to then play six, 50, 60 games and they don't even have, you know, 10, 10 times a budget or smaller than that. So yeah. they can't compete either. So it just gets even worse as you go further down the football pyramid. Mm. So what do you think with, uh, if we had a crystal ball here now, uh, Manchester United, do you think eventually it's all going to stay the same? Or is there going to be in the new year, a happy new year for all of you that uh, were hoping that there was going to be a proper takeover? Well, from the information I have, this takeover should, well, I say takeover, I say mini takeover, should be done by January. So yeah. hopefully that, that footballing structure that he wants to, to bring in with obviously Richard Arnold a few weeks ago, he's gone now and I imagine John Merce will be given his marching orders as well. So if they bring in a proper footballing structure that you see at these elite clubs and, and have a proper identity behind them, then I, then I think there'll be a bit more positivity because this club needs to employ the best in class. We can't keep, you know, giving out jobs for the boys. It's essentially, that's what John Murtaugh was. He was a, an academy coach and got given one of the biggest roles in the football club, so that needs to stop. As long as he has, you know, say over the football inside, I'd be a lot more confident than I would say with the Glazers over the football inside. Yeah, that's a, a, a good point that you make there. And with Everton in mind as well here, Gav, is that... Uh, w when it comes to the winter, the, the transfer and everything, uh, forgive me, I should know this, you know, can you go out and, and do anything? Or will you go out, do you think? Have you got anything, many money to spend? Or will that just be uh, back gonna... where you were? <laughs> no. I was going to say, being being perplexed about what we can do in January, I think is just, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I think everybody's perplexed. Nobody knows. No. I mean, we, we've got this, you know, we've got the... The, the the ownership thing to, to pan out if that doesn't happen, you know, we'll be lucky to survive January trying to pay the players, never mind bringing, bringing players in. We don't know what the financial results are going to look like for, for the previous year. So there's lots of, uh, you know, ifs, buts and maybes about that. I would like to think that we would have some money, though, because mm. we'd only operate Mark on a squad of maybe 14 players. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you, look at, you look at the, you know, the, the, the list... Mm. Of players on you know on the team sheet, you see the surnames of some of them, and the, the, and all due respect to some of the substitutes, and you go, who's he? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and you know, and I went, you're in a very dangerous position to think in squad squad terms when that's the case, because mm -hmm. I think um, you know we, we will find difficulty. I mean, we've got play, we've got at least one player going the African Cup of Nations as well, which is that as you say, people moan about it. Well, you know that when. Well, you know when that. You buy them. Yeah. You know. Uh, I, you know. I, I don't think there's a. You, 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 you can't cancel games because of the African Cup of Nations, can you? Is it. Is it. Is it. Is, what's the one with the real way if you have two or more players missing? Is that, is that gone, has it? Uh, no, I think. I it, think, I think you, it, it might. You might be might able be, to. But might be, uh, yeah. We, yeah I, but, I, I should really find out. I should know that, but I don't know that. But I mean, again, that, that actually doesn't really help um, an Everton side with a small squad. No, no, absolutely. I mean, 
we, there's, there's an interesting thing, you know, we give Decore, he, he, Decore he plays from Mali, I think. Uh, we give him a new one-year contract, you know, one-year contract extension a couple of weeks ago. And the week after that, he said, I'm not going to the African Cup of Nations. <laughs> and, you know, you, you probably, you know, don't have to be Inspector Cluso to realise those two things are probably very much interlinked. Um, um, really, um, I, you drove that, I don't know, but I think that was one way of... Um, you know, trying to you know try to stop him going. Really, I think there's other reasons because he's been good for us as well. But it, it just looked a bit it, too convenient. But yeah, it, it's it's whatever size club you you are now. As you say, it squads are an issue. But mm. we've we've got a problem in January if we've got no money because we we are operating on a very very limited number of players. And all you need and you've got suspensions having you as well. It's mm. not it, you get you get you know around that time this time year people's you know I think Young's got five yellows now. Um, that, that, that also hurts yeah. you. So there's there's a lot of things, um, a, lot, a lot of things around, which means we've just got to strengthen in January. But there's a, so much, you know, we could do a whole show on our January transfer window if you want, Matt. I think it's enough, enough material. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> I th- our show. <laughs> yeah, no, I think there absolutely is. Final word on this though, with with, with Connor. Is there a is there a feeling then that at least you can take a little bit of a breath here with wins like today? Yeah, it's one of those wins that just sort of settles everybody down. I think we haven't won a game, I believe that is our first Premier League win this season by more than a goal. So that sort of sums up where we've been this season. So it's nice to win a, win a game comfortably for a change and take some chances rather than, you know, spurning quite a few and then leaving it really nervy at the end. And I think it feels, it doesn't feel like it, but we are six points off the top of the league. And after the season we've had, it doesn't feel like we should be anywhere near that. And somehow we're leading the clean sheet count as well. So it yeah. doesn't <laughs> Obviously, when we lose games, it's very different to yeah. whenever any other club mm. loses games. So it's, it feels very weird season at the moment, but it's it's positive, especially with you know people like Luke Shaw coming back today, who I thought yeah. was one of our better players, yeah. and the young the young man Kobe Mainu midfield as well, who was outstanding as well. So mm. happy days, uh, Connor and Gavin. Thank you both very much indeed. As always, very much part of our Sunday night club here on Talk TV. Simon Duke is the. Fulham chair of the Supporters Trust, Dan Hughes, Wolves fan cost. They play tomorrow night. More on that next. Coming Monday, Julia Hartley Brewer is back. The no-nonsense queen of talk TV is in a new time slot, but still telling it like it is. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. It's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing, is it? Don't miss her brand new mid-morning show. Every weekday from 10 a.m. That's my job. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. Talk TV for the stories that matter. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. (laughs) That is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. 
Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? Use? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on at the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Well, a very good evening to you. If you're just joining us uh, tonight, a little later on uh, to finish the programme, Kevin uh, Borrett, the uh, chair at Horsham Football Club, who have a reprieve and are into the second round, playing Sutton United away from home this weekend in the second round of the FA Cup. We'll be speaking to Kevin in a short while. Before all of that, though, Simon Duke is the uh, chair of Fulham Supporters Trust. Dan Hughes is uh, the Wolves fan cast and uh, delighted to say both are with me. It's the Monday night game uh, in the Premier League. Both sides are in the uh, bottom half of the table, of course. Everton has done everybody a little bit of a favour uh, as far as everyone's concerned. But uh, first of all, uh, Simon and Dan, good evening to you. Important game, this one, for both sides going into what is a hectic and uh, I always think you're never quite sure, period, coming up to uh, Christmas. So, Simon, first with you and Fulham. You know, you're, you're, it, it, it's not perhaps been quite the season so far that you were hoping it was going to be. No, it, it hasn't, Mark. Good evening, by the way. Good yeah, evening, Don. Good evening. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a mixed season. Um, we still we can't keep going on about the fact that we've we've lost our leading goal scorer. You know that that ship has sailed. But the fact remains we've not yet found an adequate replacement. And one would hope that that come the January transfer window, that's very high on on our agenda. Mm. Um, the good news for us, I don't know if it's good news for Don, is that uh, Raúl Jiménez has now broken his duck. Um, you never know. You know, maybe that's what he needed to kickstart his season. But he, he works hard, but mm. it's not scoring. And and Vinicius and and Munez, our other two, were well, Munez is injured. Vinicius, I'm I'm not sure at this level. You know, he's had enough opportunities to prove himself. So that that really is our problem: is is a lack of goals. Yeah, the lack of goals there. And for you, uh, Don, what, what what do you think as well with uh, what's going on at, at Wolves at the moment? I feel there's a bit of optimism back at the club, Stagglers. Um, obviously, Gary O'Neill wasn't the marquee now that the majority of the fan base wanted originally when he, when he took over from Julian Lopetegui. But I feel he's got a bit of sort of fun factor back with regards to Wolves at the moment. You look back to the Tottenham game the other weekend, um, sort of going into sort of the 80, 85th minute in the last couple of years, and the majority of the, the uh, Molyneux Stadium would have probably have left by that point because there was no belief. They're going, to, they're, they're going literally to the last kick of the game now, the players and the fan base. And there's a belief now that we're starting to build. And I think if we if we do pick up a three points tomorrow night, we go above Chelsea. So there's, mm. there's optimism there. Well, I think that's a, that's an important thing. And and you you sense it, don't you, as a regular fan at times because you see them at, at home and away a lot of the time. You sense when things are going to go right and on a little run. Definitely, I feel like this group of players is starting to build a bond with the fan base whereas the last sort of rosters if you if you if you will for the last mm. couple of seasons under Bruno Large and um Hugh Lopetegui apart from sort of Ruben Nevers a lot of these players weren't really 
um, that the fan base weren't fond of a lot of these players. Raul Jimenez, that um, sorry, Sam was it? Sorry, Steve. Sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. You know, Raul Jimenez is probably like the greatest number nine that I've seen in my lifetime. Steve yeah. Ball's obviously the top goal scorer of all time. But Raul Jimenez was the complete all-round striker that we had until that horrific injury. Um, but now there's sort of a young group of players for Wolves and along with uh, a few sort of uh, experienced players like Craig Dawson who are really starting to get the fans on side. But I think that uh, you mentioned Gary there as manager and, and everything. I think sometimes these coaches, managers... Uh, who are no nonsense, but they're, they're they're not sort of the marquee names. They get a lot of work done on, particularly with young players who've got talent. Definitely, you look on the, the back of the last two international breaks that we've had under Gary O'Neill. That we we, we we have seemed to improve levels on the back of those international breaks, which is obviously I think he's only only been at the club just over a hundred days now, and he's you know you've got to give him time, and the time that he's um undertaken so far he's, he's made improvements i think we've scored something like 11 games on the bench now which is unheard of from walls in that sort of couple of seasons because we've been that boring to watch didn't create chances that's why the likes of ralph Jimenez, uh diego costa fabio silva didn't really land high in the goal charts because we didn't create enough chances whereas now we're creating we are creating enough chances but we're actually putting chances away now and i still feel there's improvement where we hopefully in the near future, we will put a team to the sword. So uh, there we are, Simon. You know, just what you want to hear on a what is always a decent welcome to uh, Craven Cottage on a Monday night. Yeah, ho- hopefully not, but uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Well, uh, just talk a, a little bit more though about the the, the 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 club and playing first of all before we come on and talk about one or two uh, other things uh, as well here. We know how difficult it is to uh, against sides in the pre- other sides in the Premier League, where you really have to take the chances. We were talking today about Everton, you know, that down and out to Manchester United in the end, but had real chances to get back into that game. You just yeah. have to take those, and I've noticed with Fulham as well. You've missed a few of those, haven't you? We we have, and you're absolutely right, Mark. You know, chances in the Premier League are at a premium, mm. and you've got to take them when when they arise. Um, you don't sense that that we're a team low on confidence. No. Uh, and I, I heard your your previous uh, item, and you know, there's an eight point gap between us and the relegation places, and and inevitably at the moment I'm looking down rather than up. But of course. Hopefully not for much longer. That's that's three wins, and and in this league, three wins is is quite a lot to achieve over and above a team above you and and sadly this year I think the three teams that came up are proving to be particularly weak I know Luton had a good result yesterday and and well done for that but you know I can I can sit here and see three or four worse teams than us now that doesn't guarantee anything but I think this year um the bar to avoid relegation is going to be fairly low so uh, we'll come back, Simon, in just a moment and talk about yeah. your work and the supporters and uh, ticket uh, prices. Um, yeah. uh, let's just hear about Wolves, first of all, that that y- y- you're feeling um, a difference at home again. At, 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 at what is a great ground? It's a fantastic when when Wolves are in full voice. It is real football noise that that everybody coming together here now you need that in this next period for you because it's a tough it's a tough ask over this next month or so definitely if you look at our fixture list i think we've we've played eight out the last um eight out the top 10 we finished last last season Mm. so we've had a tough run in the start of the season under obviously gary o'neill's coming really late into pre-season he's he's Mm. had some really tough fixtures we're starting to build belief at home i'm actually starting to get excited about away games now which is not been known last sort of couple of seasons um yeah i think there's a real belief i feel like the, the players have built a have built a bond we've lost so many experienced players in the summer ruben neves matinho um obviously uh, raul adama um the list goes on but there, it does seem to be a, a bond building with this group of players and whether it's home or away our, our back walls against the majority of teams obviously we've already beat man city at Monu this season um, we were unlucky to lose to Liverpool uh, 2-1 at Molyneux earlier on in the season. Um, so at Molyneux, our back's against most teams now, and I'm, I'm hoping that we can start taking that into our away form. Yeah, great stuff as well. Uh, affordable Fulham. 
Let's yes. discuss that a little bit if we if we may now, go. Simon. Well, let, 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 talk a little bit here. I mean, just first thing, uh, clubs in the lower leagues, as we are, are now yeah. already uh, looking at the second half of season season tickets. Uh, perhaps not so easy with the Premier League clubs, but yeah. also Black Friday, whatever you think of it, good uh, deals as well. Is there any of that going on at Fulham? Well, there is, but well, do you want to talk? Let's talk about Black Friday first of all. Okay. Um, affordable Fulham is is all about, um, you know, ticket prices. Both season yep. tickets and match day tickets for us this year have gone up eighteen percent on average, and even more for the Riverside Stand. But as I said before, Mike, let's put the Riverside Stand to one side because it's a it's a trophy asset, and if they want to charge a lot for that, and people will pay it, fine. Yeah. But have affordable football in the rest of the ground. If you're not a season ticket holder, the only way to get a ticket to watch Fulham play before they go on general sale is to be a member. Mm -hmm. And if you're a member, you get first dibs on the tickets that go on sale. Now, we only have round about three, three and a half thousand tickets that are not for season ticket holders or away fans or hospitality and that sort of thing. So you pay £50 a year and when tickets go on sale, you can buy one. Mm -hmm. So for the Wolves game tomorrow, when the tickets went on sale... I'm not sure when, but a few weeks ago, members could buy tickets. Great. Then back end of last week, they come out with a Black Friday 25% off Wolves tickets. <laughs> now, you know, how do you think members feel? They're already paying pro rata an awful lot more than a season ticket holder to get a match ticket. And all of a sudden, somebody who's nobody could come in and mm. buy a ticket for 25% less. They've done that for the Wolves game and the Forest game, which is, I think, the, the midweek of the first week in December. Um, I had a quick look at the website on Friday, and, and the Wolves position is a bit illusionary because there's not actually that many tickets left for sale. So, so they're just pretending in some ways, it's all, look yeah, what it's we're doing. Sort of creating, it's sort of creating a headline that says, yeah. look, it's 25% off. But, you know, the immediate reaction of people I spoke to is, yeah, but what about those people, those members who are already paying far more than I am on a pro rata basis. And I can give you a number in a minute, which might help explain it. But all of a sudden, they're paying a 25% loyalty tax. Yeah, It just, it just isn't right. I, I can't think of a logical reason for doing that unless they've just not sold out. Now, there's a few more tickets available for Wolves. But yeah. back to the affordable Fulham, this mm. is all about ticket pricing. Yeah. And in the Premier League, it's getting out of control. We've had tremendous support just frozen there a little bit. We want to get... Uh, have, they, have they both gone? That's, I think he's back now. I think we We're can still get, here. Yeah, we got you back. Yeah. Uh, um, yep, you're back, Simon. Yeah, we had, we had tremendous support from the trust of other Premier League clubs. The number mm -hmm. of emails I had when we publicised what we were going to do. And I think, Mark, that we are the first, and I think mm -hmm. our supporters have probably been hardest hit in terms of price increases this season. But I think we're only the first and a number of other clubs will follow. There is a lot of discontent amongst the fan base of a number of clubs about what they're having to pay for football. Now, if, if I look at my season ticket, my season ticket's £585 a year. Mm -hmm. I sit behind the goal at the Putney end because I was kicked out of the Riverside stand when they developed it. That works out at something like £31 a game. Now, that's not bad for Premier League football. I accept that. But it went up 18% this year, which cost of living crisis and everything else. Not everybody can afford that. And we've had people not renew. Mm -hmm. Match day ticket pricing also went up 18%. The seat next to me is not sold on a season ticket. So I get a variety of people there, usually away supporters, which is another thing we challenge the club on. We get an awful lot of away supporters in home areas. Yeah. The United game was a classic. I think you've seen my statement mm. that referred to a Twitter post that's now been taken down. But that showed the bottom half of one section of the Fulham home end all jumping up when United scored. Yeah. So it can't be, for me, it can't all be Fulham supporters passing their tickets on for that many in that concentrated an area to mm. be to be United fans. But the seat next to me for the United game was £77. Yeah, ridiculous. That's without, that's without apportioning your membership fee yeah. so let's say you go five times a year 50 pounds a year that's another 10 quid that's 87 quid against the 31 pounds i'm paying that's a big differential and when you bear in mind that people who are members who don't have season tickets mm. are either those who 
can't get to every game because of work patterns or whatever, so it's more cost effective for them to be a member. Or they're people who genuinely can't afford to go to more than two or three games mm. a season. They're the ones being priced out. Can I ask you one question uh, on this? Do you, do you think there are many season ticket holders at Fulham who actually don't support Fulham? Yes. And is there not a way that those can be identified and not allowed to have that season ticket then? We we think, Mark, there, there seems to be a disparity between what the clubs say about games selling out and what you then observe in the ground. Uh, cleverer people than me on the board have a look around just after kickoff and say there can be two, 3,000 empty seats. Yeah. Now, they're seats that have been sold. Now, you have to start making assumptions when you look at this, but if you assume they're unlikely to be match day sales because if you didn't want to go you wouldn't buy a ticket by definition they are probably season ticket sales and we think there's a lot of people who live in London yeah. who want to see Premier League football but perhaps don't want to go and see the likes of Luton, Sheffield United but want to see Chelsea, Liverpool Manchester City and what have you so you know if our ticket exchange opens they could resell them but to be quite frank I don't think they can be bothered No, they just, they just don't turn up now, they are not Fulham supporters, but one of the problems of being a London-based club is if you start trying to do things by postcode, <laughs> it becomes very difficult because a lot of people live in London. You can't yeah. tell if they're Fulham supporters or not. I think it was, was it Arsenal or maybe Arsenal and Brentford came out with something that said, if we find you've attended, sorry, failed to attend more than four games, we reserve the right to cancel your season mm -hmm. ticket. Yeah. But, you know, so, some season tickets get passed around. It, it's, I don't know. I, it, I mean, It's something that you're going to fight. We've, I'm afraid we've come towards the end of the time. I hope, is there anything else you need to say right now? No, we're, we're going to fight. And all, all I would ask is that people like your good self, the media, yeah. we're, we're going to let them know what we're doing. But good. the club so far have declined our invitation uh, to, or, or they failed to commit to our invitation to undertake a pricing and strategy review with some input from the trust, not because we can set ticket prices, we can't, but just to hear us out. They will put it on the agenda for our monthly club meeting, but it's been on the agenda for monthly club meetings for as long as I can remember, and we just get nowhere. But this well, time, I think we've passed the tipping point. Well, and we'll, we'll keep uh, inviting you back here until something Thanks, gets done properly, Simon. Thank you very much Thanks. indeed. Final word with you, Dan. Things a little cheerier, though, in the uh, West Midlands. As mentioned, obviously we get three points tomorrow. We're in, I believe we're going tenth place above Chelsea. So, yeah, let's, let's just keep being positive. Hopefully, we can explore the January transfer market, and um, yeah, up the walls, Mark. Good man, Dan and Simon. Thank you very much indeed for being part of the Sunday Night Club. So we're just finishing with the chair, and it's the chair of uh, Horsham Football Club back in the second round of the FA Cup this weekend next. It's the world's number one interview show, the new global home of big debates and big questions. This is really unfair. Why? We'll explain why. For all the big names. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. You're going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, of course, I cannot continue my work. Did you feel Elvis was a controlling influence on you? And the good news, you've already found it. All new Piers Morgan Uncensored, right here, Monday to Thursday, 8 p.m. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. 
for the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. People of Britain, do you fancy a good dose of common sense before bed? Because the Independent Republican Mike Graham is now in prime time. We still cover all the stories that matter and put the world to rights. We just do it a little bit later on. So don't miss the Independent Republican Mike Graham Monday to Thursday nights at 9 p.m. right after Piers Morgan Uncensored. Yes, the revolution will be televised. Well, it won't be the last, but it's, I think, the first for Horsham, having been reinstated to the FA Cup after Barnsley, who beat them 3-0 in that replay, um, had an administrative error uh, as far as one of their players is concerned. And uh, it's given Horsham the opportunity to take on Sutton United away this weekend in the second round of the FA Cup. And delighted to say that the Horsham chairman, Kevin uh, Borat is with us right now. Hi, Kevin. Mark, lovely to be back. I think this is a hat trick of appearances. Well, is, well, well, and and very good luck to you as well. So, Nirav, the uh, chairman uh, of um, Barnsley, got in touch, didn't he? Is that is that how you first heard? Yes. So, um, uh, Nirav uh, phoned me uh, the uh, the Friday. Uh, before the uh, this week's uh, bombshell announcements to explain that there had been an error, that they had been charged by the FA. So we discussed the likely range of sanctions that might occur um, and and how the two uh, clubs could collaborate. Um, yeah, yeah, obviously a disqualification was, was a potential outcome, but I, I think a replay was also a credible uh, alternative. So we discussed the practicality and timings for that, and we did input into the, the Barnsley uh, appeal as well. And uh, in the end, who, who decided? Was it the FA obviously decided? It's, it, was the, it was the FA, standard yeah. FA tribunal and uh, for, you know, normal decision process. Um, yeah, I'm not. I don't think it came as a total surprise to Barnsley. Um, mm. I'll be honest; it probably came as a little bit of a relief to us because the thought of having to work 24/7 for 10 <laughs> days to get another game on <laughs> <laughs> would have worked. Yeah, was was uh, it, we'd have done it, 
but it would have been an awful lot of work, Mark. Well, now it's Sutton United who are a League Two side. They are bottom of League Two at the moment. But uh, I, I saw a quote from Dom, uh, your uh, De Paolo, of course, your uh, manager. He said that the, the, the squad is sort of still in a bit of shock about all of this. I think not just the squad, I think the, yeah, the, the whole club is in a bit of shock and I think some of the town as well. But look, no, you know, obviously we're delighted that we're still in the cup, but you know, w- yeah, we feel for Barnsley. Yeah, they did beat us 3-0 in the replay. Um, I think the, the 100 uh, position difference in league t- told a bit on that occasion. And you know, I'm personally gutted for, for the Barnsley supporters because... We, we have a great relationship with them. Um, we, I think we've really built a relationship between the two clubs. But um, sometimes these things happen. You know, we've, uh, we've gone out of other competitions, Mark. So we're in this one and we're going to Barnsley next, next Saturday. And it's a winnable time. Well, uh, I, I remember, actually, uh, th- 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 this sort of I- I- exact problem that was, it wasn't a problem as such, but for me, when I was trying to learn how to be a sports broadcaster, I trained every day with Cambridge United for three years. And at one stage, they'd sent one of their players away on loan, and then the other player that was in that position had got um, injured. And it was a goalkeeping position, and they used to use me at times for a bit of goalkeeping practice. And I and, uh, I'd played, uh, I played against Leighton Orient and one or two other sides uh, for them. Uh, in in a reserve team game, but they they had to register me for the the football league, and uh, even though I was only going to sit on the bench, but I remember the meticulous work of uh, the secretary Phil Huff at the time to make sure that absolutely everything was uh, spot on. So I bet you've you've checked everything with all of yours, haven't you? Well, we have because we we did have a player suspended for the replay. And so it did, of course, raise the question, uh, you know, does his suspension during the replay count? After all, you could imagine the schoolboy error if we happen to beat Sutton and yeah. then be disqualified for fielding an ineligible player. That really would uh, would yeah. take the biscuit, wouldn't it? So, um, no, we, we, we check everything. And I do, you know, I think your, your example really draws out the amount of work that league secretaries... Yeah paid or volunteers have to do and it is you have to get it absolutely right it's not just the spirit of it it's the letter of it as well yeah and i think everybody understands that so that's all done it's all be completed um I, what is this a bonus for over a thousand fans going to be able to travel to this game yeah so we've got tr- we've got uh, 1265 tickets season ticket holders um have priority yeah. then the tickets went on sale today uh, to the general public and we sold out in about 90 minutes fantastic the remaining allocation so we're taking an army of coaches up uh, over a thousand uh, people and you know i think the stadium will be full i'm sure so five yeah. and a half thousand in sutton it's going to be a great game i think you've got two teams and we, you know who are fairly evenly poised. Yeah, well, that, that, that's the thing. And, and as far as you're concerned as well here, I mean, if if you can manage in any way, either a draw or uh, even a win, then uh, this this is turning out already into financially an important part of your season. It, it is. We've got a relatively new ground and we've got some improvements we'd like to make to the overall experience for for our supporters um, and and I think I mentioned before some fairly basic improvements as well such as toilets yeah. and and more covered standing and um, this helps us to achieve that a televised replay of course would would, would, would be quite lucrative <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd just be quite happy to get to the fir- third round proper in the first week well, of uh, yeah. January and, and and who knows who we, we might get for that one. So When is the game? Is it next Saturday, 3 o'clock? It is. It's Saturday, yep. 3 o'clock. Saturday the 2nd. Um, I I work outside the UK in the week, so um, Saturday, I can't leave before Saturday, so I'll be up at 4.30 to mm. get a flight that gets me into Gatwick about 9am, so that gives me plenty of time to get to the ground. Well, let's hope we could well be talking again next weekend. 
That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? It, it really would. Kevin, delight to talk to you again. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. Kevin Vorat, chair of Horsham. They play Sutton. Keep you right up to date with all of uh, the FA Cup to come next week and everything else. It's been a great show tonight. And uh, all our thoughts with Terry Venables, his family and uh, close friends. And uh, we heard some great tributes tonight here on the Sunday Night Club. And following us on talk radio, of course, is the voice of Howard Hughes and well, the I'm Unexplained. Hoping so. well, I'm hoping so. Just I'm... to say, you know, to join the tributes to Terry Venables, you know, I worked in the glory days of Capital Radio. Yep. We had a substantial sports output in those days. It certainly did. Uh, with the magical Jonathan Pierce and others. Yep. And, you know, we knew they were very much a part of what we did in those days. People like El Tell and Arsene Wenger and all those people from that generation. So, you they know, he will be very sorely fabulous. missed. They were. Um, you anyway. now... Anyway... Uh, let's think more of where you are. I've been fascinated. I was fascinated, by the way, with JFK because that, that is my American history uh, of that time is something that, uh, that, that I, I really do enjoy reading about. And uh, all of your talk about all of that last week was fantastic. Well, you know, I think we had to do something. I don't think I'm going to touch the subject again. No, you said that, Unless didn't you, the there is something mega. Unless yeah. there is something that, you know, finally gives us a revelation that we might have been expecting, then, yeah. you know, then I'll do it. But yeah. I think we had to... We had to draw a line under it last week, and yeah. I hope that we did that. You now, did. tonight, yeah. we have a world exclusive. Uh, Christopher Mellon, the former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defence and a key member of the Galileo Project. He's on for most of the last hour. Um, first hour, UFO update... Nick Pope in New York. There are big developments. Cyber 